أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for our annual supporters dinner. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our event sponsors as this would not be possible without them. From our platinum sponsors, we have Rahma Market. From our gold sponsors, we have Kabul Kebab and Grill, Rajabali Family Dentistry, Law Office of Spojmi Naziri, Rumi Bookstore, and the Law Offices of Ross Pitlick and North Star School. Again, we thank you for your contributions and continued support. <laughs> My name is Iman Hamzi, and I am a second year student at Zaytuna College. From attending Sunday school, to shadowing my mother as a volunteer at nearly every event, to teaching Sunday school, and even getting married here this past January, I am proud to call the Muslim Community Center of the East Bay my second home. For those of you who know me, you'll know why when they asked me to be the MC tonight, my first thought was, hmm, I don't know why they'd need an MC in the babysitting room. In all honesty, it is an absolute honor and a pleasure to be able to be here with you tonight and to be a part of giving back to the very community that has given me more than I could have ever imagined. I must say that it was the culture cultivated within the very walls of MCC, the bonds forged with some of the incredible people amongst us here tonight, and the guidance and support of my beloved teachers, friends, and family that has given me the opportunity to attend Zaytuna College. So, as we commence this blessed night, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for creating and supporting MCC, a place that not only allows us to unite as brothers and sisters around our Islamic tradition, but perhaps even more importantly, a place that is a safe haven for nurturing our youth while equipping them with the necessary foundation and tools to tackle the challenges of society today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce one of the Bay Area's foremost Quran teachers, a top prize winner in the National Moroccan Tajweed competition, and someone who I have the honor to call my teacher, our very own Qari Amar Ballaha. Assalamu alaikum. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Wa mathalu alladhina yunfiquna amwalahumu abtigha'a mardatillahi wa tathbeed. من أنفسهم وتثبيتا من أنفسهم كمثل جنة بربوة أصابها أصابها وابل فآتت أكلها ضعفين فإن لم يصبها وابل فطل والله بما تعملون بصير أيود أحدكم أن تكون له جنة من نخيل وأعناب 
تجري من تحتها الأنهار تجري من تحتها الأنهار له فيها من كل الثمرات وأصابه الكبر وأصابه الكبر وله ذرية ضعفاء فأصابها إعصار فيه نار فاحترقت كذلك يبين الله لكم الآيات لعلكم تتفكرون يا أنفقوا من طيبات ما كسبتم ومن ما أخرجنا لكم من الأرض ولا تيمموا الخبيث منه تنفقون ولستم بآخذيه إلا أن تغمضوا فيه واعلموا الشيطان يعدكم الفقر ويأمركم بالفحشاء والله يعدكم مغفرة منه وفضلا والله واسع عليم يؤتي الحكمة من يشاء ومن يؤتى الحكمة فقد خيرا كثيرا وما يذكر إلا أولو الألباب وما من نفقة أو نذرتم من نذر فإن الله يعلمه وما إن تبدو الصدق 
الأوقات فنعم ما هي وإن تخفوها وتؤتوها الفقراء فهو خير لكم ويكفر عن سيئاتكم والله بما تعملون خبير صدق الله I would now like to introduce someone who is very near and dear to me and who happens to be my mother also. She is the president of MCC and has been a dedicated volunteer for many years. Her relentless hard work and passion for serving this community has been invaluable to the day-to-day -day operations of MCC. Please join me in welcoming Sister Catherine Hamsey. Salam alaikum. I, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. And before I started, before I started, one of the board of trustee members asked me, slow down when you talk, Catherine, and are you nervous? But as I stand up here and look out, I realize that I'm standing before friends. I have nothing to be nervous about. Inshallah, we as the board of the Board of Directors can move forward to successfully achieve the work that lies before MCC. I would, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly introduce some of the Board of Directors to you, and if you could stand as I say your name. We have Amir Mustafa, the Vice President, Farhan Jaffrey, Amin Tawana, the Treasurer, Samir Lazkani, Asir Sikdar, Ufan Alam, and Daniel Abasi, who is not with us tonight as he is traveling for work in China. Last year, Mohammed Baruha, the Vice President, stood before you and spoke about MCC's three goals for the year. And those three goals would be how MCC would engage and help our community members engage with Allah, within our community, and with the outside community. With regards to connecting with Allah, this year we have gone at MCC to regularly holding two Friday prayers. Kariyama holds classes on Mondays and Wednesdays. We used to have 20 students in those classes. We now have 40 students in those classes. Kariyama's HIFS program continues to grow. Sister Mona, Sh Mona Schwan, who teaches on Tuesdays and Thursdays, her classes continue to grow. Imam Zaid Shakir has conducted a year-long lecture series each Wednesday. Feridun Majadedi, Sheikh al-Bakri, and Faraz Khan are among other Bay Area scholars who have provided classes during the last 12 months. In fact, Faraz Khan has a class starting next Saturday on the halal and the haram of the tongue and the heart. Imam Tahir provides a short study session each Tuesday after Esha prayer. And while I'm up here and I have the opportunity, this is the last Tuesday we're doing it after Esha. Next week, the week after, we start doing it after Maghrib prayer. Rahma Girls program run by Dr. Rania Awad is held every Friday at MCC. Over 90 girls attend that program. That same Rahma Girls program also runs a girls camp at MCC during Ramadan. What we don't have at MCC is a program for boys ages 4 to 12. If anyone sitting in this audience tonight can help me fill that void, you should reach out to me or to our new center manager, Munir Safir. 
Within the community, we were very happy to welcome Imam Tahir to our staff. With that, Imam Tahir, we have family Friday nights the first Friday of every month. After Ramadan, we will have Friday nights the first and third Fridays of every month. And to add a little extra spice to our Ramadan this year, we will have three new khatibs brought in. Not only will they do the Juma prayer, they will provide study sessions after Tarawiyah. We will have community suhurs every Saturday during Ramadan, followed by Fajr prayer, followed by a study session with those same scholars. Two years ago during Ramadan, we introduced new guidelines for when you came to pray Tarawiyah. We gave people an opportunity with children to pray while their children were properly taken care of, or for mothers with children to have a place to pray. Going forward, we will be extending the services we offer during Tarawiyah prayer so that women and community members can stay longer and enjoy the full benefit of Tarawiyah prayer. I have received a lot of feedback that if you want a quiet place to pray Tarawiya prayer, then MCC is the place for you. We have started a new series of Arabic classes at MCC. They're held every Thursday and every Saturday. The first, this first series focuses on vocabulary acquisition, grammar skills, and sentence structure. The goal for this course is for students to be familiar with Quranic vocabulary, analyzing basic sentences, and having a good command of grammar. Each course is, a three, is three months, and we invite you to sign up. With what has been going on in the country in the last year, security has become a big, big concern of people at MCC. In response to that, we hired a security consultant who did a complete and thorough evaluation. We're happy to report that MCC is at a very safe place to be. The last hate crime reported in the area was 10 years ago. With this evaluation, we will be improving the cameras at MCC, activating the alarm system regularly, and installing panic buttons for use of the Sunday school staff. What I'm very happy to tell you is that when the consultant evaluated the Sunday school, he was very impressed at the level of security and concern that was provided for all of the Sunday school children, and will also be providing ongoing training for Sunday school volunteers with regard to the safety of the children. As for the outside of the MCC and how we're connecting with the outside community, MCC has started offering a free legal clinic. It is not only open to MCC members, it is open to anybody in the Tri-Valley area. It is the third Thursday of every month. You get a free 20-minute legal consultation, either on immigration. We have Spojmi Naziri, an attorney with MCC who has headed up this clinic and who is with us here tonight. Spojmi is also the president of the Bay Area Executive Care Committee, and she focuses on family-based immigration and citizenship and deportation defense. We also have Ross Pitlick, who offers his services on family law and criminal law. And we've just added a new attorney, Samara Bandari, who does living trusts, wills, estates, powers of attorneys, and health care directives. They're all specialists in their field, and we encourage you, if you don't have a need for an attorney, if you know anyone who does, to send them towards MCC. As for the Interfaith Committee, the Interfaith Interconnect is a large organization in the Tri-Valley area. Recently, Imam Tahir spoke at one of the Interfaith gatherings. There's a point to notice here. At the Interfaith gathering at MCC, we had 180 people. We had 12 Muslims. Interfaith is reaching out to our community. We need to reach back out. We know we're under threat and we know with current political, the current political situation, what's going on. When people reach out to us, we should make every effort to give back to them. Brother Muhammad Ali on the 
Board of Trustees started a refugee welcome group with members of the MCC community and is working with other groups in the area to welcome Syrian refugees. We do an annual food drive during Ramadan and every year we collect about 1,500 pounds of food for the, for the Alameda County. We are, we are a large, very diverse community with a multitude of cultural and ethnic differences and mores. MCC, as it is today, the mosque and community center, is a testimony to the strength of Islam in binding individuals into a robust, thriving community. And today we are together in this room as proof of that strength. Alhamdulillah, we are all here together today that under the umbrella of faith, we continue to grow in strength and numbers and providing a living proof of the true Islam of growing in the United States. Thank you. The next person I'd like to welcome to the stage is a serial entrepreneur and has been a strong advocate for Muslims with the local congressman. He is also a founding member of the Board of Trustees and has been instrumental in the establishment and development of MCC. Please give a warm welcome to Brother Wahid Qureshi. Assalamu alaikum. You know, today I can definitively tell you that MCC has come of age. And let me tell you why. Since 2007, we have been doing these fundraisers. And every year, we have to look back at our slides to make sure that you're in sync with your slides. Today, when I came in, the audiovisual team told me that you don't need to look back. There is a, uh, there's a screen right here. So that will give me an opportunity to be more focused. So my name is Wahid Qureshi. So let me start. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, young boys and girls, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So uh, today I'm going to give you, let's see if I can get this thing to work. Okay. Where do I point it? Okay. So I am one of the members of Board of Trustees, uh, together with all of my colleagues. Uh, I think you probably know some or all of them. I won't take their names. You, they are all around here. Please feel free to meet them. And we always like to hear from you. So today, I'm going to focus on a few important aspects. Uh, you know, this is a fundraiser, so every time we give you a financial update and update you on why we are doing this fundraiser. So that will uh, take me to the second point, which is the infrastructural update on what we are doing with MCC, how we are improving MCC, and what resources we are adding to MCC to scale our operations. Um, but I will start first with talking about engagement. I think uh, Sister Catherine talked about it, but as we all know, since last year, after the events in San Bernardino, we were all very unhappy and upset, not only at what had happened uh, in care for our country, but also all the statements that were coming out of the media and even some uh, uh, you know, uh, folks in uh, responsible positions. So uh, you know, we, we asked ourselves, actually, we as, as a community, the board of directors and trustees, and uh, you know, we got together. And we thought about it, and we said, what do we need to do? Obviously, we cannot change everybody's mind and heart, but the one thing that we can do is this whole idea of engagement, right? So if I can summarize this, uh, it's all about... Having problems. Okay, I think you saw this slide, but let me... Uh, let me elaborate this just in a different direction. So first of all, we have, alhamdulillah, engaged with Allah. That's why we created MCC, right? So a place where we can pray to Allah, seek his guidance, and, and do all the right thing that we need to do as Muslims. Hmm? It is on, yes. It is on. It is on. 
Uh, sorry. Sorry for this. Still some challenges I can see. OK, so, uh, so we asked ourselves, OK, we are doing that, inshallah, but inshallah, we'll increase that. Secondly, we said, what can we do to come together as a community, right? What can we do more to help our youth? And inshallah, we'll do more, you know, whether it is youth internships, whether it is helping our youth uh, with mentoring, and anything that we can do even to help other Muslim organizations. But the most important decision that we made last year uh, you know, after the events in San Bernardino was that we should not stand still, we should not sit silent, we should make sure that we reach out to not only all the other religious organizations, but we should also reach out to everybody else that has a say where Muslims come in, right? So whether it is elected officials, whether it is our neighbors. By the way, yeah, it does matter what our neighbors are thinking, right? You know the MCC facility, we have a lot of neighbors around us. And they, some of them actually had questions about us. What are we doing in MCC? What do we do? What do we do as Muslims? How do we pray? And all that, all that good stuff. So we have decided that going forward, inshallah, we will not only uh, you know, do all the things that we do, but we are going to double up on them, but also we are going to spend a lot of our effort reaching outside of our community. And let me give you an example of the, one of the things that we did in trying to reach out to the outside community. So after the events in San Bernardino, when we saw all the, all the media attention on Muslims and, uh, and all the other uh, negative things that came out about Muslims, we said, look, let us not let others control the narrative. Let us tell people what Muslims are all about, what M American Muslims do. So we actually, in partnership all, with all the major Islamic centers in the Bay Area and in Southern California, we published this op a small ad in all the major newspapers in the Bay Area they were either full page or half page ads. So I think you know, this is one of the little steps that we have taken. And inshallah, we will continue to do more. And I ask actually anybody here in this audience to please come and help us. If you have expertise in communication, uh, you know, uh, marketing, come, at, come out and help us because we need that, because we need to make sure that our point of view is heard uh, you know, when important issues are being discussed. OK, let's now move on to talk about the uh, about MCC and why are we doing this fundraiser today. So first of all, if you all remember, in 2010, we all came together and we bought this building. This building is actually, mashallah, a large facility, five acres, 4,000 square feet. It's, however, it was built in, you know, in, in the mid-80s, so it needs continuous uh, improvement. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of surveys. We ran a lot of surveys, focus groups, to get insights from the community as to what should we do with this place, right? So you must have seen that, you know, we are slowly and surely every year we're doing more and more uh, remodeling of this facility. So our goal is that uh, we will, inshallah, by 2019, we'll complete the remodel. Uh, as you saw last year, we did the remodeling on the prayer hall, the conference room, and this year we're going to do more. We're going to improve the most important place where we need to go before we go for prayers, which is the wudu area, the bathrooms, and all that place. We also need to upgrade some of the facilities within MCC. Uh, for example, we need to uplift the ceiling, you know, raise it a little bit, things like that, right? So there's a lot of work that goes on, and we will, inshallah, continue this. Uh, and, uh, you know, just to share with you, in the last six years, we have done actually a lot of interesting work on MCC to make it to where it is today. So the most, the first thing that we did was uh, we, we actually upgrade the AC system. And we also build the rental facility at MCC. I'm sure all of you know that MCC has a daycare center, which is a rental facility. You all know that, right? So we did that first. And that is because when we created MCC in 2006, me and my other trustees colleagues, we said, we want to make sure that MCC should be financially viable all by itself without constantly needing donations. And, in and you know, I'll share with you, I think we are very close to that point. And by the way, at that point, some of the very established folks told us, forget it, it's not going to happen. But alhamdulillah, and with your support, you know, we, we were able to achieve that. But that was the first thing that we did. The second thing we did was that we paid off, again, with your help, we paid off the MCC building, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, last year, which, which I'm sure you remember. Last year, we did a major renovation on the center. You saw all the new carpets. We, you know, we improved our, uh, 
you know, the, the conference room, we improve the security system, the PA system, and inshallah, we'll continue that. But the most important thing that we did last year is that we increased the human uh, element of MCC by actually hiring two, uh, you know, uh, formal staff members, if I were to call them that. First is, you know, Imam Tahir Anwar. Imam Tahir, thank you very much for becoming part of MCC. By the way, MCC from day one, we have had all scholars, you know, they are part of MCC, but we wanted a scholar in residence, right? We wanted somebody who's here, not, not for all the grown-ups, of course, that's okay too, but it's mostly for our youth, you know? And Imam Tahir showed a lot of uh, uh, interest in that. And secondly, as you know, MCC is a 40,000 square foot facility. It's a big facility. There are issues with landscaping. There are issues with security. There are issues with uh, all kinds of maintenance and operation that needs to be done. So alhamdulillah, we actually hired a center manager. Um, you know, Munir, he's here, mashallah. He is a very dynamic individual. Uh, and we, we hope that with all these infrastructure improvement, we are in a very strong position to continue that engagement that I was talking about earlier. Let me go on. Now, let's go to the MCC financial summary. When I started this slide, I had actually had a very complex spreadsheet, but I decided to just you know, show you the most important things, the top line and the bottom line. The top line is that, alhamdulillah, we have revenues every month of $37,500. And that's because we have a rental facility and because of the generosity of the community. So today, our monthly expenses are about $25,000. You know, this includes staff salaries. We have, we have various contracts for, you know, whether it is security, whether it's landscaping, utilities, uh, and whole, you know, cleaning services that we, that we employ at MCC to make sure that we keep the center in a, you know, in a nice and workable place. Uh, and alhamdulillah, we actually have, every month, we have a cash flow positive thing. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we are keeping this. We use this to pay off any, Karze uh, Hasna that come to use, we use it for other ongoing operations. But Alhamdulillah, this is a very positive situation. Takbir! Thank you. Okay, so now this is an important point. If you remember, if you came here in 2007, we asked all of you for a very novel thing. We said, give us a loan. We called it Karzai Hasna and we said, give it to us and inshallah we'll give it back to you. And I'll tell you something very funny. Everybody told me on the side, they said, Brother Wahid, this is great. Inshallah we'll give it to you, but you know, don't, we know you will, you're never going to give us back. And we said, no, inshallah we'll give it back to you. And by the way, the, at, the, at the height, we had 1.8 million. And today, we only have 509,550. Alhamdulillah, right? But again, this is your generosity. This is, this is your generosity. Now, today, we have $550,000 left, and it belongs to some people in this who gave it to us. And by the way, they gave it to us only for one year. And some of them gave it to us in 2007, and since then, they have been holding off but we need to return their money. I think they have done their part, and we need to do that. So inshallah, in the next two years, we want to bring this down to zero. You know, the Board of Trustees, we are also very interested in the long-term strategy and planning for MCC, the long-term vision. In 2006, alhamdulillah, we were blessed with this idea of where we stand today. So the question is, what is next for MCC? So first of all, as I said, let me just summarize again. We will continue to grow our engagement, services with the community. We have increased our human element, you know, that we have, inshallah, which will allow us to scale more services for the community. We'll continue with the remodel of, of MCC. And also, in the next two years, we want to pay off Karzai Hasna. It was a promise. It was a sacred promise we made, and inshallah, we want to return that to, you know, to all, to, you know, to whoever paid us. By the way, there are 52 families. Uh, another point I want to share with you is that the highest amount of Karzai Hasna we got was half a million dollars. Can you believe that? Somebody gave us half a million dollars. Of course, we returned it to them two years ago, but they gave us. You know, they believed us, they trusted us, and we gave it back to them. Another point I want to make is, 
that an anonymous member of the community in the beginning of MCC gave us $1 million. Donation. Right? So takbir. May Allah give that person a lot of ajar for that. So inshallah by 2019, we will finish the remodeling of MCC where it will be ready for another 30 years inshallah. And at that point, the most interesting thing that keeps me thinking is that MCC endowment fund. As you know, nonprofits, universities, they have this endowment fund which they use for doing all kinds of activities, you know, to grow their services. So perhaps we can create this endowment fund to help our youth. We can give scholarships, right? We can create a home, a, a, a facility for retired Muslim professionals, for example, right? I used to live in Danville, and the first thing I saw when I moved to Danville in 1997 was a home for elderly Jewish folks. I actually went there, and I talked to them, and I realized it's a great idea. So, I mean, as I get, I, as I become a senior citizen, I would like a place where I can live with other Muslim senior citizens, right? You know, watch the same good TV channels, eat good food and all that good stuff, so why not? So look, these things are possible, inshallah. So we are planning for them, we are thinking about them. So keep, keep, inshallah, pray for us that let's hope that we can create this endowment fund for, for MCC and hopefully, I think this will be a great source of benefit to the entire community. More about that in the coming years, inshallah, but please pray for us that we are, we are doing it. So now, this is the most important time. I was here in 2007, and now I'm again here after a few years. I, by the way, my work took me uh, out of the country you know, a lot, so I, I haven't been around, but inshallah, I can tell you one important thing today. Today, we are at a very good spot. But we have a call to action. We have a few things to take care of, and let me share those with you. So first of all, we are having lots of challenges in our country today. So let's make dua for MCC. Let's make dua for our community. And let's make dua, most importantly, for our country. There's a lot of interesting things going on, and we want to make sure that you know, Allah guides us. Secondly, today, we are requesting you that we need to raise $300,000. And the reason is as follows. Half of that amount we are going to use to pay off Karze Hasna. It's very important because there are some people who have asked us specifically. It's overdue and we want to keep our promise, inshallah. The second thing is that we want to continue this remodeling. It's very important that we remodel the facility so that it, it remains you know, fit for our use, inshallah. And I want to thank everybody you know, I want to share something with you, personally. The most difficult thing for me that I've done in America is MCC. I've done many other things. They were more difficult, but they were not as difficult. You know, doing something like this is more difficult. And inshallah, with your support, we will achieve these goals. So, uh, I remember in 2007, somebody asked me, Wahid Bhai, can we really do this? I said, inshallah, we'll do it. The second question used to be, what if we can't do it? And the only answer was, inshallah, we'll do it. So inshallah, we'll do it. So now, thank you very much. Let's break up for uh, Salat. And no, not yet, OK. But uh, thank you very much. And inshallah, uh, we'll, we'll be talking to you soon. Asalaamu Alaikum. We all know that this next speaker has a very extensive bio, but per his request, I will just say that he is our resident scholar, a Zaytuna College faculty member, and a very dedicated community activist. Please join me in welcoming Imam Tahir Anwar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I begin in the name of Allah, most merciful. I bear witness that there's none worthy of worship except him and that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his last and final messenger. When we chose Iman as tonight's MC, I knew we made a good choice. Round of applause for Sister Iman. I have been attending the MCC 
events, dinners, for many, many years. And in addition to attending MCC's events for many, many years, I've also had the honor of attending the events of many other nonprofits and masajid in the area in the last decade or so. And I must admit, as Brother Wahid mentioned a few moments ago, that we've actually come a very, very long way. And what MCC has been able to accomplish in the last decade since its inception is phenomenal. It's actually not a story that many institutions are able to tell you. It's not a story that many masajid are able to say. Right? This is not the experience they're able to share. Despite the fact that we have a lot of masajid in the area, there are institutions that are still trying to build. There are institutions that are still trying to construct. There are institutions that are still trying very, very hard to pay off very, very large loans. And it was last year or the year before when we sat at this event, when we reminded ourselves, we reminded the community that our loan, the institutional loan that we had with the financial institution has been paid off, right? That was magnanimous, that was amazing. And then as Brother Wahid mentioned, we had a very large loan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assisted and facilitated for us to almost pay that off as well. In fact, we're so close to paying it off that here Brother Wahid stands and reminds us that we are going to begin an endowment project very, very soon. Let me ask you a question. And most of you in this room continue to attend events of many, many nonprofit organizations and masajid in the area. How many institutions have actually told you on stage, made a promise three, four years ago, and year after year they continue to fulfill that promise? Right? And they're actually standing on stage in 2015 and 2016 and telling you that in the next few years, we're not looking for money to pay off our loans. Rather, we will be coming to you to begin an endowment. Right? There's very, very few institutions that are actually able to do that. And for those of us that happen to be a part of this community, part of individuals who attend the MCC for our prayers and our activities, we should be very, very proud of that. We should be extremely proud of that. I mentioned this in the khutbah yesterday, that I was in London in this last week. And I was asked by a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, said, would you be interested in moving back to London? And the reason I say back is because I lived there for the first five years of my life. After comparing what we have right here in our community, it's very difficult to fathom living and moving elsewhere. And we take this as a community, we actually take a lot of things that we have for granted. Our institution, the MCC East Bay, is not simply a masjid. It's not simply a place where the men go to pray, as are many institutions. Rather, it happens to be a place for the entire community. We have room for the sisters in our community. We have room for the brothers in our community. We have room for the young in our community. And very soon, we'll be sharing an update with you. Just this last Friday, we had this basketball event for the youth in our community. And over 50 kids showed up, and we went to the close-by middle school, and they just had an amazing time. So our com the, 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 goal, the goal of MCC East Bay is not simply to cater to a certain specific element of our community. Rather, the goal is to cater to the entire community. And I said this in the khutbah yesterday, that we may not be perfect in providing those services to the community, but with your help, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance, inshallah, we will get there as a community. We will get there collectively. And as you can see, both the board of trustees and the board of directors are working extremely hard that all the feedback that you give, they continue to make promises to us. And year after year after year, they continue to fulfill those promises. So inshallah, this evening, in the next few moments, when my dear brother and sheikh and teacher and friend, Sheikh Ala, comes onto stage and asks you for your funds, I can guarantee you, inshallah, due to my experience that I've had with MCC in the past, that your dollars will go to the right place, inshallah. And everything, everything that they have promised to you will continue to be fulfilled.
And this is also a board of directors and a trustees that's open to your feedback. Sister Catherine, when she was here, she asked for volunteers, right? We continue to ask for people who can assist us. If you have feedback, we welcome your feedback. We welcome your prayers. We welcome everything that you have for us, inshallah. And collectively, because this institution is beyond one individual. This institution is larger than one or two bodies of a few individuals. This institution belongs to the entire community. Right? This institution belongs to every single one of us sitting in this room and individuals that couldn't be with us tonight. So I would hope and pray, inshallah, that you continue to support us with your presence, with your du'as, with your dollars, and collectively we will make this a community center that will be a light and beacon, not just for our community, but for everyone. For everyone in this country and around the world, inshallah. That said, one last thing I'm going to share. As Sister Catherine mentioned, inshallah, we will continue with our family night programs. You'll be hearing from us about our youth programs. But at the same time, and I'm not going to take this away from Dr. Brown, but this happens to be a very, very important year. Right, this is a very, very important year. And I would urge every single one of you, urge every single one of you to do whatever you can in your capacity as citizens of this beautiful and amazing country to make sure that your voice is heard. And every single one of us, it's a responsibility on every single one of us to ensure that this responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that God Almighty has put on our shoulders, we make sure and we exercise our right to vote. Right? That is something that is extremely important for us as Muslims. And this year is going to be an important year, though the optimist, the optimist individual in me tells me that inshallah we will overcome as this country, this country and the people of this country have always overcome the difficulties and inshallah we will collectively as a community choose a leader for our country, choose leaders that represent us who happen to be individuals that, mor that are moral, upright and that actually con that have concern for the entire community. Jazakumullahu khairan, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. With that said, I'm going to invite a few of the members of the board uh, for a brief award ceremony. And then the, the, the award ceremony is very, very brief. And inshallah, immediately after that, we will pray Maghrib. So hold your horses. Maghrib is not going anywhere. Uh, just be patient. We'll uh, start Maghrib in a few moments, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome, everyone, to the dinner, fundraising dinner. Um, I am the the Vice President uh, on the board. Uh, also on the board is Brother Asir. And uh, we're here to just uh, briefly talk about uh, a few uh, members of the community that were instrumental in uh, helping the MCC uh, become more uh, of, a, of a center for, for our community, for everyone to come and, and engage and come together and learn and pray. And so these uh, community members were uh, there from, from the start. I'd like to first thank uh, Brother uh, Basha Sajjad. Is he here? Yes, he's right here. Uh, please come to the stage. Uh, Brother Sajjad was very instrumental at the beginning of uh, the MCC. And uh, one thing you may not know, but we actually work for the same company. I'll, I'll give it a plug, Lamb Research. <laughs> um, so, Brother Sajjad was uh, the secretary. He helped to get the center ready for prayers and uh, helped quite a bit in uh, getting the center started in its early days. So, uh, the, the award, thank you very much, Brother Sajjad. Okay, round of applause, thank you very much. Okay, this next award um, is uh, to a uh, community member who has been instrumental in reaching out to other faiths in the, um, the Tri-Valley area. 
the uh, Christian community, the churches, and the synagogues, and has, has helped to uh, foster a, um, a, an environment of, of, of sharing and caring, um, you know, serving uh, the same goals for our community as their community, and, and reaching out. Uh, so I'd like to ca call on stage Brother Abdul Awal. Uh, can you please come to the stage and accept the award? Okay, so uh, so th that was the um, a part of the the evening for uh, recognizing uh, some of the key uh, instrumental people that were uh, uh, helped out the MCC, and now I'll turn it over to our MC um, sister. It is an honor pre to present this next award to someone who we are so lucky to have within our community. As the principal and founder of our Sunday school, she has been one of the most dedicated members of MCC. She can always be found before and after school hours, working hard and taking care of all the moving pieces needed to run a school. Personally, I am grateful to have worked with her directly and to have witnessed her wholehearted commitment to MCC. I think I can speak for all of these staff, volunteers, and even children in saying that we love her very much and we pray that Allah continues to bless her each and every day. Please welcome to the stage, Lubna Qureshi. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm borrowing or stealing a minute from all of you. I just want to acknowledge the fact that this is not for Lubna Qureshi, this is for volunteerism. So I would appreciate our second sister, Catherine, who said that we should all volunteer, so it would be a good idea that each one of us should come, up, come out and come up and volunteer and do whatever they do best. Thank you so much, Jazakallah Khairan for all for this gesture. Thank you so much. We will now be breaking for Maghrib prayer. We ask that you please leave your shoes at your table to prevent safety hazards by the doors. The, men, the bathroom can be, is located out the door and to the left if you need to make wudu. And the sister's entrance is through this door to my right. And the men's entrance is out the back door and to the right. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. We're going to ask that everyone please take their seats again as we would like to begin the program now. While we have a minute, we'd also like to recognize a few special guests amongst us tonight. The first is Cheryl Cucalio, former Vice Mayor of Pleasanton, running for assembly in District 16, which includes Pleasanton, San Ramon, Danville, Moraga, Arinda, Lafayette, and parts of Walna Creek. If you, if you like to get more involved, if you'd like to get more involved in the community, please get in touch with Cheryl online or in person here. The next person we'd like to, to the next person we'd like to recognize is Emma Root from Stone Ridge Creek.
Sami Rahmadi, event coordinator at the Center for Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union, and Sally Bistroff of the First Presbyterian Church. We would now like to introduce our keynote speaker. Having studied his books at Zaytuna College, I am especially excited to introduce to you our next guest, Dr. Jonathan Brown. Since 2012, Dr. Brown has been associate professor at Georgetown's University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. In 2014, he was appointed the chair of Islamic Civilization. He is the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam and Law. He has authored several books, including Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy, Hadith, Muhammad's Legacy in the Medieval and Modern Worlds, and the canonization of al-Bukhari and Muslim. He has also published articles in the fields of Hadith, Islamic law, Salafism, Sufism, and the Arabic language. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Brown. Assalamu alaikum. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Thanks very much for inviting me. And just so you don't think I'm trying to skip out on fundraising, my donations in that envelope. Jonathan Brown doesn't freeload. I also will donate something else. I have being you know in the Bay Area, I want to contribute my intellectual capital. There's talk of a Muslim senior living facility, and that means there's going to be a lot of slippers. Automated slipper bringing. You know, someone can work on that, on the app. You two were supposed to laugh out loud at that joke. This is, okay, um, so I, I, was, I, I wanted to talk about the issue of what Muslims have contributed, and what Islam has contributed um, where Muslims and Islam have spread. And I want to talk about what Muslims and Islam can contribute here in the United States. The first thing that spread with Islam was justice. Justice spread with Islam. Justice and rights. And this is true not only in the founding scriptures of, scriptures of our religion, but it's true in historical practice as well. Islam offered basic protection of rights, basic due process, something that is important to keep in mind today. And it didn't matter if you were nasty or nice, if you were pious or impious. You had rights, you had the right to present your evidence, you had the right to defend yourself, you had the right to demand that person making accusation present proof if they were going to if you were going to be convicted. And just some examples from the life of the Prophet, in the Sunnah of Abu Dawood, there's a beautiful story about a man from Hadramaut and a man from the Kinda tribe. And they were in a dispute over land. And the Hadrami man accuses the Kindi man of taking his land. The Prophet says to him, to the Hadrami man, he says, Alaka bayina? Do you have some direct evidence? Do you have witnesses that this man took your land? The Hadrami man said, no, I don't. But this Kindi person, he's a bad person. He's a bad person. So the prophet turns to the man from the Kinda tribe and he says, this man has no direct evidence. He has no bayina. And we all know that in Islam, if the person who's making the accusation has to have direct evidence, has to have bayina. If not, the person who's accused just has to swear an oath that they're innocent. And the kinda man swears an oath that he's innocent. The man from the Hadrami tribe says, this person is fajr la yubali ma halifa alayh. This person is a sinful person, he's openly sinful, he doesn't care what he swears about. Of course he's going to swear he's innocent. And the prophet says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is all you're going to get from him. If he's telling a lie, then God will punish him on the day of judgment. But just because this person is a sinful person, just because he's a nasty person, 
doesn't mean that somehow you get to come and make an accusation against him and you get to get your way. No, he has a right to defend himself. And if no one can bring evidence to prove that he's committed a crime, then he swears an oath that he's innocent. It doesn't matter if he's a nasty person or not. So it doesn't matter if you're naughty or nice. In Islam, you have rights. It doesn't matter if you're Muslim or non-Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or Jewish. You have rights. And again, we see this in the life of the Prophet. In one famous case in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, the companion Ashaf bin Qais is in a dispute with a Jewish person in Medina about land. And the Prophet asks Ashaf bin Qais again, Alaka bayina? Do you have direct evidence? The man says no. Ashaf bin Qais says no. And the Prophet wait, rules in favor of the Jewish person. And Ashaf says, how can you... How can you rule in the favor of this unbeliever against me, a Muslim? And the Prophet says, you didn't have bayana, you didn't have evidence. In Islam, it doesn't matter if you're Muslim or Christian. It matters what the evidence is. You have, the, you have rights. No one can take away, as great scholars like Abu Yusuf in his Kitab al-Kharaj, like many other Muslim scholars have said over and over again, no right, no property can be taken, no blood can be shed without direct, strong proof, without haq ma'loom, without a right that is known. This is sort of hard to imagine because today, especially as Muslims living in the United States, we live in a country that has already a robust system of rights and laws from which we benefit and which I want to talk about. But for, many, for much of human history, where Muslims went, there were not robust legal systems. There were not notions of the protection of rights. So for example, when the Mongols converted to Islam, they had these courts called Yarghu courts. Don't even worry about how to spell that. It's a Mongol word, okay? They had Mo these Mongol courts. There's no notion of evidence. People just came in and said, this guy did this, this guy did that. The judge hears them, decides what he wants to do, kills someone right there, executes someone right there, takes someone's property right there. No notion of rights. When Mongols converted to Islam, they adopted Sharia law. When the famous traveler Ibn Battuta is traveling in, 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 uh, in now it's part of Sudan, right near the, on the Red Sea coast, he comes across a people who, they're not really Muslim. They're sort of a little bit, they know about Islam, but they're not really Muslim. And he notes they didn't give their daughters any inheritance. They didn't give their daughters any inheritance. In Islam, daughters always receive their rights. Always receive their Even if it doesn't matter. As a parent, you, all you Muslim parents know this. You might not like your child. You might love one of your child and hate the other kid. But they both have their rights. They always will have their rights. Muslim scholars, as judges and as muftis, were always pushing rulers not to use excessive force. Not to deny people due process. And I can give you so many examples of this. Muslims, who, scholars who lost their careers, who lost their lives, speaking out on the behalf of people who were accused unfairly, people who were the victim of some vendetta on the part of the ruler. I think actually Republicans should, should like Muslims because Muslims were always, have always been opponents of unfair taxation. These are the original Chai party, right? I just came up with that joke right now. There's, again, if you really, I, I really recommend this. Go get The Travels of Ibn Battuta. It's three volumes. It's published in Delhi. That's where I got the copy, at least. Well, I mean, I got it from another place. It was published in Delhi. It's very good. Translated by Hamilton Gibb. Excellent. We learned so much, so many great examples. Ibn Battuta was a judge. He was a scholar. So everywhere he'd go, he noticed things about Islamic law, which is fascinating. So when he goes to India, during the time of the Delhi Sultanate, Ghiath ad-Din ibn Tughluq, in the, the mid-1300s, when he goes, he enters Multan. He comes from Central Asia, from Afghanistan. Uh, he said something very interesting about Afghans, by the way. He said, Kabul used to be a nice place. Now it's ruled by this tribe called Afghans, which is interesting. I swear, that's in the book. You can go check it out. He, goes to, he, he notices that when he first enters India, the Delhi Sultanate, the Delhi Sultan, Ghiyaduddin ibn Tughluq, is levying one quarter tax on everything that comes into his, all imports. One quarter tax. If it, 
much more than that, it'd almost be like Egypt, right? He, and, but what happens after the, the Abbasid Caliphate, the Abbasid Caliph sends a letter, people think the Abbasid Caliphate ended in 1258, it didn't. The Abbasid Caliph was still in, in, uh, in Cairo after that. Uh, he sent a letter to Qiyat ibn, ibn Tughluq, recognizing him as the Muslim ruler there. And after that, the, the Delhi Sultan Qiyat ibn, ibn Tughluq felt very guilty about his taxation practices. He only then uh, levied the Sharia taxes of the Ushur and the Kharaj and the Zakat. This is something that's hard to imagine, hopefully, in the United States. But just the idea that it's the person who commits a crime who should suffer for that crime, this is also something that in many places is introduced by Sharia law. And I know this because when I taught at the University of Washington, we had these Afghan legal scholars who would come every year. And they were special, one of them was a specialist in Pashtun Wali, which is uh, Pashtun or Pashtun tribal law. It was, I had very interesting con conversations with this man. Very interesting. Because he said, and one of the rules in Pashtun tribal law is that, let's say I kill somebody's brother. He gets my sister as his wife. Now, that may resolve the conflict, but what did my sister do? I'm the one who committed the crime. In fact, I've been trying to find out from lawyers what you actually call a legal system that just says the person who commits the crime should answer for that crime. And they, no one can give me the answer because it seems so, it's so basic that people don't really have a word for uh, legal systems where someone else besides the person who's committed the crime is, actually bears the punishment for that crime. So this is, for, for many parts of the, 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 the world where Muslim, where Islam appeared, they didn't have notions even with it the person who commits the crime is the one who should be punished. Muslim scholars that I mentioned before were constantly trying to limit, you have these you know, warlords, basically. Pre-modern states are almost always ruled by military leaders, right? And these are the guys with all the muscle. And more often than they're not, they're not exactly the most educated. They're not always the most, uh, the, they don't always have the best temper, most, best anger management skills. And oftentimes, Muslim scholars are trying to advocate very gently, sometimes forcibly with these rulers to, to not apply punishments as harshly as they do. So, for example, in... In Aceh, one of the earliest parts of Southeast Asia to become Muslim, already Marco, Marco Polo visits there in the, in the 1290s, of the common era, and he sees that already people there, are, not only are they, uh, are they Muslim, but they're, they're actually using the Arabic alphabet. This one scholar, Nur al-Din Raniri, in the 1600s, he managed to convince the Sultan of Aceh to stop boiling criminals in oil. So he, it's, he's actually very proud. He's very proud that he's accomplished this. Because he's, he's managed to get the, the ruler to stop this, this, this punishment that has no place in God's law. Another thing, and this is going to be very surprising to a lot of people, um, not here, but a lot of people in the, you know, maybe American media, where Islam spread, religious liberty spread. The Quran, when it says, so religion can be for God alone, this is a serious commitment that Muslims have. Religion it belongs to God. And actually, Muslims had a notion of religious liberty that in some ways is much more robust even than in the United States. People don't, uh, you know, people tend to think of Muslims as being intolerant or Islam as being intolerant. But actually, Muslims in Islamic civilization, Muslim scholars and Muslim rulers exercise a level of t religious toleration that would really not, Americans wouldn't accept it. It's too tolerant. It is too tolerant. I'll give you some examples. First of all, people often wonder, how did Islam spread so quickly in the Middle East? Right? So the, the Prophet Laysa died in 632 of the Common Era. By 650, Muslims had reached all the way into Central Asia. In 711, they entered into Iberia and into what's now Sindh in Pakistan. Okay? How did, in 636, 637, they've taken over the entire Middle East, including Egypt. How did they do this? Actually, most of it was because the people who lived there, the Christians and Jewish population, we're really happy to have someone besides the Byzantines and the Persians ruling them. Especially people like the Muslims who absolutely didn't care what religion you practiced. In the year 632, the year the prophet died, the Byzantine uh, emperor, the Roman emperor, issued an edict 
that was going to force all the Jews in the Roman Empire to convert, to convert to Christianity. Something that had never been done before. Forcible conversion of all the Jews in the Roman Empire. Fortunately, just a few years later, all the Byzantine lands fell under Muslim rule, and these Jews were not forced to convert. In fact, they thrived. And you can go read uh, David uh, Wasser Wasserman's book, for pre a professor at, uh, um, at Vanderbilt University, How Islam Saved the Jews. A very interesting uh, article he wrote. Sorry, not a book. But you can find it online. Similarly, why would Muslims, anyone ever wonder why Muslims built their first city in Egypt where Cairo is now? It wasn't Cairo back then. It was called Fustat. Why did they build it there? I mean, they could have... Alexandria is a much bigger city. Why didn't they go and make their capital Alexandria? Because they were a collection of monasteries. They still are a collection of monasteries where now Cairo is. And Muslims settled there because they were there and they were, the, the, the monks in the monastery were going to help them administer Egypt because the Byzantine emperor had forced the Coptic bishop to leave his position and had appointed a Byzantine Orthodox bishop in his place. And the, and the Muslims, when the Muslims invaded, they went in with the support of that ousted, Byzantine, uh, the ousted Coptic bishop. And they put him back on in charge of the, the church in Egypt. So they entered with the support of, the, of many of the, the, Coptic, the Coptic clergy there. What about religious toleration? This, uh, to this day, I, I get surprised by this. I couldn't remember the first time I read this, I was so surprised. So Muslim scholars had a debate. They talked about this issue because it happened. What happens if there's a Zoroastrian, in Zoroastrianism, and this, is true, this was true in Zoroastrianism up until the 1300s, you could have brother-sister marriage and father-daughter marriage and mother-son marriage. Actually, it happened. It wasn't just a theory. It actually happened. And so the question was, can a Muslim judge, let's say, a brother or sister married couple, Zoroastrians, come to the Muslim judge. Can the Muslim judge adjudicate their marriage? Let's say they have some dispute over maintenance or property. The answer is, the, the majority answer for Muslim scholars is yes, you can. Even though this is something that is completely haram in Islam, the Muslim judge, he accepted, he said, this is your religion, you have your religion, I have my religion. I disapprove of it, I don't accept it, but I'm gonna, I acknowledge you have this right. Similarly, if people had, who weren't Muslims had riba contracts, Muslim, if you have a riba contract, it's an invalid contract. No judges. It's like having a, like a, 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 you know, a drug dealer is coming and saying, you know, he cheated me out of my cocaine shipment or something. Judges aren't going to listen to that. The same thing in Islamic law if you have riba contract. But if it was people who were not Muslim of riba contract, Muslim judges had no problem adjudicating it. Even sati, sati, the... the, the uh, widow self-immolation, the tradition, especially amongst the Rajputs in India, where a Rajput noblewoman, when her husband died in battle, she would throw herself on the, the funeral pyre. And you can go, if you go to some of these old cities in Rajasthan, India, you can see on the walls of some of the big fortresses, these handprints in henna, where women would put their handprint on the wall as they were going out to, to throw themselves on the pyre. And of course, it's a very controversial. And in fact, the British ended up banning it in 1829. And still to this day, I mean, people will talk about this. And it's still a very controversial practice. Muslims allowed it. On one condition, you had to get the permission of the sultan. This, we know this in the case of the Delhi Sultanate. The Delhi sultans allowed this. But you had to get permission of the sultan. Why? Because the sultan, Muslims have a rule. We will allow non-Muslims to practice their religion amongst themselves, even doing things that we think are haram, like drinking alcohol and raising pigs and marrying brothers and sisters and having ribbon contracts. But nobody, as long as no haq adami, as long as no, no one's rights are being violated. So let's say there's a religion where it's okay to go up and just knock someone on the head with a tack hammer and take their money. No, that's not okay because this is violation of acknowledged rights that people have. You have a right to property. That's a human right in Islam. You have a human right to property. But if the woman herself wanted to do this, if she wanted to throw herself on the pyre, the Muslim, the Muslim sultan, at least the evidence we have, there's not a lot of it, but at least the evidence we have says that they didn't have, Muslim rulers had no problem if they did this. This is a level of toleration. Imagine, imagine in America today, American court acknowledging brother-sister marriage. American courts don't even acknowledge polygamous marriages. 
So this is a level of, of uh, Muslims are very serious when they talk about religious liberty. They're very serious. So what are the lessons that we can take away from this today? And the more I, I was, as I was listening to the speeches and I was uh, talking to a um, lovely sister from South Africa, always wonderful to meet South African Muslims. We were speaking earlier about rights, rights. So wherever Islam spreads, rights spread, justice spread. Wherever Islam spread, liberty spread, religious liberty. In America today, Muslims can be pillars of rights and religious liberty. Pillars of rights and religious liberty. And I was, someone came to my office the other day and asked me a very interesting question. They said, what would you, what would you like to see if you could in affect change in the society? What would you like to see? What would you be your, how would you measure your, the success of Muslims in this country? And I'm sure there's lots of great religious ways that I could measure that. And, you know, Sheikh Hamza could probably give much better discussion of that. But the thing that came to my mind, I had this image of a statue on the National Mall and the statue of a hijabi woman. Probably we shouldn't have statues. Okay, that's one problem with my vision, but um, I don't know. find out some way to do this. Maybe it's a stylized statue or it's a calligraphy statue, right? My idea was this, this statue of a Muslim woman wearing a hijab who is gonna be this, who is gonna be an acknowledged hero of civil liberties in America. So that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, people, people in the United States were gonna look and say it was Muslims who stood up for civil liberties, who stood up for rights and liberty in this country. They became a column that held this up. Like where Islam spread, liberty spread, justice spread, so too here in the United States where there's promise of liberty and justice. But people try and take that liberty and, liberty and justice away from people without due process, because of bigotry, because of fear. Muslims can stand up against that and be a column a buttress against that. So what can we do today? What, what, how can we, when people talk about rights, you have the idea of exercising your right. I want to exercise my right to freedom of speech. I actually think that word exercise is very important. Rights aren't things that you just have. You know, it's not like jumper cables in your car, or you, know, you leave them under your seat for two years and then you use them. You have to exercise rights. It's like a muscle, you have to exercise it. This is very important. We always have to exercise our rights because otherwise you don't know how to use them. You don't know how to be courageous. You have to pr practice being courageous. And it's hard because a lot of times Muslims, especially Muslims in certain parts of the country who tend to be doing very well for themselves, mashallah, as a descendant of immigrants who came here centuries ago and never made any money, I have nothing but respect for my brothers and sisters here. People who have good life in this country they think sometimes they can just hide. They can keep low and they'll, they'll be safe. Well, this is a bad year for that plan. Because let me tell you, if you're an oppressed minority, you can't hide. It doesn't, you don't even have to be Muslim. They go after Sikhs. They go after, just, this Buddhist monk got beaten up, for God's sake, right? You can't hide. But nor should you have to. You shouldn't have to in this country. And if you don't practice being strong, you won't be able to be strong when the time comes, when challenges really present themselves. How do we practice? How do we exercise courage? Let's think about how do we do it with rights. People have a right to a fair trial. People have a right to be considered innocent until they're proven guilty. We need to practice that. We need to exercise that. I don't care, just try this. This is what I do. I mean, I don't want to use myself as an example, especially because my wife would probably disagree with me being used as a model, but I'll just tell you what I do. Whenever somebody, you see someone come up on TV and they say, well, this person's guilty. This person's guilty. Even like Bill Cosby, everybody loves to, to say how bad Bill Cosby is. You know what I always say when people mention Bill Cosby? I say, innocent until proven guilty. Innocent until proven guilty. It's a very simple, it's, not, it's our legal obligation. People in this country are innocent until they are proven guilty. And it doesn't matter how nasty they are, it doesn't matter how mean they are, it doesn't matter what they're accused of, it doesn't matter the length of the sheet that the government brings out and reads all the crimes they're accused of and that everyone's so sure they did, they are innocent until they're proven guilty. Just like the Prophet ﷺ accepted the oath of that man in his own self-defense even though he was a sinner. People are innocent until they're proven guilty. You need to practice that, you need to exercise that belief. 
There's no, no guilt by association. This is very important. I remember just a few months ago when the San Bernardino attack happened, and there's people from uh, CARE came out and were supporting the families of the, one of the shooters. I think it was the, 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 the guy's family, right? And one of my friends is probably a Donald Trump supporter. He said, he called me, he's like, why are these people on TV? Why is the, he's not Muslim, he's like, why are the funds of the Muslim community being used to support these people, these people? I said, these are the families. They didn't do anything. Even if, let's say they committed a crime, let's say the parents committed some crime or something like that. They're innocent until proven guilty. They deserve to have legal representation. They deserve to have support. Is this the kind of community we're going to be? We turn our backs on people the second they're under suspicion? No. This is precisely when you show your strength. It's precisely when people are, are being accused that you need to stand by them. Precisely when pe the, the, the media or the public is trying to make them toxic that you have to hold them close. That's a matter of principle. And by the way, you're going to be happy that people have exercised that right when you get accused. And when, like Eric Clapton says, nobody knows you when you're down and out. Sorry, that song always comes to my mind. Too much uh, Eric Clapton unplugged when I was in high school. The, but I want you to stand by people's family. And here's a great way to exercise this right. On my website, drjonathanbrown.com, I think. It was a present. Uh, they, there's a link that says right to, right to a prisoner. There's all these Muslim prisoners who've been t targeted by things like we saw in Orange County, who've been victim of uh, uh, basically entrapment, or maybe they even committed crimes. Maybe they even committed crimes. It doesn't matter. You are allowed to write them. You're allowed to write them a letter, even if they're a horrible criminal. You can write them a letter and say, Assalamu alaikum, I just want you to know that there are people out here who are thinking about you. And you, when you talk to prisoners, they tell you when they get these letters, it makes the, the world a difference to them. It means everything to them. Just getting a letter means so much. And you can, uh, also during Ramadan, uh, there's on my website as well, a link for a group, NCPCF, National Coalition for the Preservation of Civil Liberties, civil freedoms, where you can help donate money to prisoners, Muslim prisoners during Ramadan, so they have money to buy food during Ramadan. This is very, it's, I want you to practice this. It's legal. There's nothing wrong with it. It is legal. There's nothing wrong with it. It's your right. You need to exercise these rights. Don't let fear make you deprive yourself of rights. Don't make fear deprive other people of rights to contact, to support, to, 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 to association. Because that's how... That's how majorities work in societies. That's how they keep minorities under control, keep them in their place. They don't do it necessarily through physical oppression. They don't do it necessarily by putting people in prison. They do it by creating fear. You have to break that barrier of fear. You have to break it by exercising your rights. Finally, what about liberties? How can Muslims contribute to the preservation of liberty in this country? Well, we're going to have a chance. <laughs> we have a chance now. That's the great thing about being Muslim in this country. It's always interesting, right? Always have a chance to make a difference. We need to, we need to ask people how far, how, much, how, how serious are they about religious liberty? You know, you often, I just read the art, this other article, the, this article the other day, I was very upset by it. This, Mus, this Muslim named Ed Hussein, who works for he used to work for the Quilliam Foundation in England. Some of you people from the UK know about this. Uh, and I think now he works for the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. He wrote this article where he said, he said, talking about how Muslims don't stand up against extremism. One of the things he said Muslims need to stop doing, he said, Muslims, they, they, put the, they wear hijab. They put hijab on their young girls, as younger as five, four or five years old. First of all, and I don't have any daughters, but I'm pretty sure girls, when they put on hijab, they want to look like their mom. They want to look like their mom. And you know what? It's their right to look like their mom. And you know what? Guess what? If a Jewish parent wants to put a yarmulke on their child or a certain type of clothing on their child, you better believe that's their right in this country. And you better believe no one's going to tell them they can't do it. This is our right as parents to raise our children according to our religion. Why is it, 
a sign of extremism? Why is it something to be disgusted at or to be poo-pooed or to be looked down on that Americans are exercising their right to freedom of religion by having their children grow up in the same religious tradition as they did? These are things that people, you know, how many times have you heard, how many times as a Muslim have someone come to you and said, as if you're a woman, why don't you just take your hijab off tonight? Just take it off, you know. Or when they offer you pork, why don't you just try some pork? Come on. Or why don't you just try some alcohol? Don't be such a, don't be so, don't be so serious. Since when has it become un-American not to drink? Since when is it un-American to cover your hair? Since when is it un-American to have a beard? Being American has nothing to do with how you dress. Go ask Amish people. Go ask Jewish people in this country. Being American doesn't mean you drink alcohol. Go ask Mormons. They don't even drink caffeine. No one has a right to make you dress in a certain way or drink something or eat something to prove you're, to, to prove you're American. You don't have to do that. They don't have the right to ask you to do that. So again, how are we going to exercise? How are we going to exercise this liberty? We need to make people in our daily lives, with people, we need to make them respect our right as Muslims, our right as Americans to have freedom of religious practice. And it's tough. It's been really tough, especially when you're young. And I have so much respect for young Muslims when I meet them because they're so strong and they are so guided. They're so focused on what's right. So I'm very optimistic about the future. It's going to be a tough time ahead. But, inshallah, this will be a chance for American Muslims to, as Muslims have done in the past, bring justice, bring liberty, and in, do so, in doing so, win the respect of others in this country who claim, many of whom claim sincerely, to value this justice and liberty very much. Jazakallah khair. Our next speaker began his study of Islam at a young age in North Africa and continued his education in the Islamic sciences in Jordan, learning from predominant scholars in the Muslim world. He has served the Muslim community in the United States in numerous capacities, serving as imam at several Islamic centers and establishing full-time and weekend Islamic schools. He has also served as a founding board member of Iman, Inner City Muslim Action Network in Chicago, and as a book editor for Ikra and an advisory board member in many Islamic organizations. Having been trained in both Islamic sciences and secular education, he has the ability to appeal to various audiences and his main focus is in helping Muslims develop a deep understanding of the self, life, and faith. He currently serves as the Khatib at Saratoga Masjid in California. Please give a warm welcome to Sheikh Aladin al-Bakri. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala wa stanna bi sunnatihi wa ahtada bi hudah ila yawm al-deen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, la quwata illa billah. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was making tawaf around the Kaaba and there is this one person that was making tawaf next to him and he kept on repeating this dua and Sayyidina Amr al-Khattab after a while he became curious what is, what is this all about so he kept on saying Allahumma ja'alni min al-qaleel Allahumma ja'alni min al-qaleel Allahumma ja'alni min al-qaleel so Sayyidina Amr asked him what is that he said haven't you read what Allah said in his book wa qaleelun min ibadi al-shakur and few of my servants are actually thankful. So may Allah make me from the few, may Allah make me from the few, may Allah make me from the few. Maybe we have few people in the hall tonight, but alhamdulillah, it's usually few people who change history. You actually don't need many people to change history, and no one knows that better than Allah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends one messenger to change the reality of a whole nation. One. Just one. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the necessity, He will send two. Musa wa Harun. Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salam and his son Sulaiman. Zakaria and Yahya. They were together at the same time. Rarely, as a matter of fact, one time in the Quran, in Surah Yaseen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he sent three. وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا أَصْحَابَ الْقَرِيَةِ إِذْ جَاءَهَا الْمُرْسَلُونَ إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمُ اثْنَيْنِ فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثِ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ so Allah sent two messengers. They denied them. Allah supported them with a third one. Take two steps and look, brothers and sisters. Who is that one or two or three? Now imagine, mashallah, we have a room that has two, three hundred people. That's more than enough. If we had a plan and we are sincere and dedicated to change not only the reality of Pleasanton, but probably the Bay Area, California, and the United States, and from there, the world. I don't like to talk big. I like to dream big. And I like to talk real. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, we have at this time to dream big, but to start acting small. Yani, mashallah, you heard from the speech the principles of Islam. I believe, I believe, you know, as myself too, many of us here are immigrants. And I am proud to be an immigrant in a nation that is made of immigrants. There's nothing wrong with that. And many of us are actually going through rehab. <laughs> many of us are transforming from the beliefs and from the habits and from the convictions and from the way of life that we came with from our homes to come to this new land, a new opportunity, a new situation that Allah put us in to liberate ourselves from the old way of thinking to the new way of thinking is a process is not going to happen overnight but the good news that it is actually happening. We're going through a group therapy Moving from fear, usually in the countries around the world, third world countries, shh, don't talk about politics. We want to be safe. We don't want the secret service knocking our doors, right? If you see someone walking behind you, even in a park, you're like, why are you walking behind me? <laughs> we come with fears, fears that have been instilled in us. But it takes time to liberate ourselves from these fears. And we can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with children and our children are growing up knowing how to communicate with both worlds, with the world of their parents and with the world of the real streets out there. And they're able to accomplish. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, someone like our brother Basim Al-Qarra, born and raised in San Francisco. He could have had a million successful jobs that would make him hundreds of thousands of dollars if not millions he chose to go and work with care and until today he could make at least 10 times of what he's making if he actually would practice with his degree so this shows that the transformation is happening our sister here that will make a hundred men shake and shiver but yet with her you know, femininity and with a smile, our sister Zahra Bilu, right? <laughs> you know, she can call whoever you want her to call, the FBI, the CIA, the, the police, anything, any agency, the national uh, intelligence services, and she will speak with strength and with no fear. The good news, brothers and sisters, is the change is happening. And every time the change is happening. The people who don't like that change will get louder and louder, as you can see. People thought like, whoa, after eight years of George Bush, that's it. Muslims are gone. They're done. 
unacceptable, unaccepted in this reality. But subhanAllah, you know, I know he's not a Muslim and I don't believe he's a Muslim. But for a president to come after eight years of George Bush and his name is Barack Hussein Obama is a lesson for those who need a lesson from history. And for him to appoint people in his cabinet from Sister Dalia Mujahid to uh, you know, Brother Shaheed, who's a Hafiz, who was appointed to the world, you know, Muslim World Organization, to this and that, to the White House staff, people are Muslims. People bet that we're not going to do that. It was after September 11 that the first Muslim congressman was elected to the United States House of Representative, Brother Keith Ellison. And very soon, with the election of President Obama, another African-American uh, representative from the state of Indiana, Northwest Indiana, was elected and he was a practicing Muslim. And Keith Ellison survived all the attacks, the vicious attacks, uniting the Muslim, the black, the Latino, and the Jewish vote. And he's still winning year in, year out. When did that happen? After everyone was bitting that Muslims will be finished. That's why, brothers and sisters, the bright, the future is bright for those who think that it is bright. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And our hope is not in our whatever we do. Our hope lies in God and in the help of God to us, inshaAllah Rabbil Alameen. When you talk about these big ideas, these big ideas have to start from small places. Small places, you know, one time we used to say MCC was small. Now we can't say it's small because you're talking about 40 some thousand square feet. But M MCC, when you talk about the activities, you have to do simultaneous things at the same time in order for the community to survive and prosper and grow and do what it's supposed to do. You have to take care of the new generation, the children. Oh my God, when I went and visited MCC in their high, I mean, weekend school graduation last year, 400 children. I mean, do you understand? For That's an entire generation. 400 children in that school, and they have a waiting list. You know, do you know how lucky we are? The Prophet Wasallam says, the Prophet comes on the Day of Judgment, and only 10 people listen to him. Only. Everybody else said, we don't like you. You're backwarded, ridiculous. We don't understand you. You talk about God. But we, we're not interested. Get out. The Prophet comes on the Day of Judgment with nine, eight, seven. And the Prophet went up to one. And he said, the Prophet comes on the Day of Judgment with no one believing in him. By himself, on himself, by himself, by him. Just standing on the Day of Judgment, no one believed. 400 children. I mean, do you know what that would mean to a Prophet? A Prophet, not us. <laughs> now imagine when you take, this is the weekend school. Add to that the crowd of Salat al-Jum'ah. Now we have two full-time Salat al-Jum'ah in MCC. Add to that the woman activities and the woman halaqas. Add to that our brothers and sisters, you know, in Rahma, which they gather the, the children. And, you know, I live in Santa Clara. And my wife would drive from Santa Clara on Sunday last year just to MCC, just to join the girls of Rahma and sit down and learn about Allah and make some nasheed and beat the daf. And she, would, she cannot wait the whole week. I mean, she goes to an Islamic school, full-time Islamic school, and still she cannot wait till Sunday comes so that she can go and join the Rahma girls at MCC. I mean, do you understand? It's like 35, 40 minutes drive, especially if there is uh, traffic, you're talking about an hour. Brothers and sisters, there are activities in MCC, alhamdulillah, that people gravitate towards these activities day in, and I can go on and on and on. On the top of that, they are able to rent some of the space and generate income. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know a single Islamic center in the Bay Area or in California that generates $25,000 in rent a month. Congratulations to our brother and sister in the MCC. Please give them a hand. Now that's the way to do it. You want to know how Islam's, Muslims and mosques should function? Go to Turkey. They build the masjid, then they build a huge bazaar around it. And next to the masjid, the rooms for the imams and the mu'addin. Then the rooms for the students. Then the school. Then the market. 
and then all of the markets and its waqf endowment supports the masjid and the school and the imam and the cleanliness and the renovation and the remodeling. We need to bring that back again. And alhamdulillah, we are very close to that point at MCC in which we will have inshallah zero debt and inshallah we will start having making income that will cover a large part of the operation because right now part of that $25,000 goes back to paying off Al-Qard Al-Hassan. I mean MCC as of today and please brother Asif and brother Sad Azhar Siddiqui correct me if I'm wrong MCC as of today owes zero dollars to the bank for the loan that they took 1.8 million am I right or wrong am I right or wrong please give them a hand of applause I mean fundraising after fundraising you wonder where your money went try to buy this property today where they bought it for 4 million try to buy it for 8 million try to buy it for 12 million today the value that of that property is already alhamdulillah and it happened in the right time we bought in the right time and we sold the other land in the right time and I'm a witness you know brother here uh, keeps on meeting me and says remember the first fundraising for MCC when we fundraised for that land you were there I said brother not the first the first and the middle and the second and the third and the tenth and today the last I'm always there I mean come on it's like I know I know when the fundraising of MCC more than I know my birthday come on people it's there on the calendar brothers and sisters alhamdulillah we are able to make history because look in the south bay we started having huge we know mca was there and now we added mashallah sbia and masjid al mustafa seventy thousand square feet i mean do you think these places are doing nothing they are making history silently you go to mc to sbia and rahima you know foundation is sitting there giving food for everyone muslim or not how do you think people make history by sitting down and just praying you have to get down to the level to the grassroots level and start making the society problems you problem and you have a solution because people of faith have a solution they have compassion they have love they have mercy they care and brothers and sisters you might not see the change like overnight, oh, we did this today. Tomorrow, it's the whole chain. The Muslim situation in America has changed. It wouldn't be for the sake of God if that happened. But Allah tests you and tests you and tests you. And slowly but surely, things are getting better and better and better. Including the candidacy of Donald Trump. It's one of the best news that happened to Muslims in the recent history. This guy is amazing. <laughs> He has united us with everybody else. Thank you, Donald Trump. It's equal opportunity. Now, Muslims, blacks, Jews, Latinos, south of the border, north of the border, we're all on the same. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair for what you're doing. <laughs> Every time you're pointing one finger at someone else, you're pointing three at yourself. You know, what are you doing? He's doing group therapy. People come, oh so mad at barack obama the black muslim president we're gonna change it they come charged they're ready you know and then he comes and gives them group therapy talks talks talk. <sighs> they all feel good and they go home good so he's just doing like dr phil you know do you remember dr phil and oprah he's another dr phil group therapy dr phil does it on individually donald trump does it on a group level thank you very much you know but you know this is not this is not gonna go anywhere brothers and sisters even if he wins the presidency, he has to change because America will not tolerate that. I mean, subhanAllah, if the Republican are looking at him and say, he's vulgar, he's vicious, he's this, okay, wow. <laughs> if the Republicans are saying that, someone is learning a lesson. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you know, we are here to deal with everyone, Republicans, Democrats, that's not our business in the masjid. Our business is to serve everyone, to serve those who are in need, and to walk in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, I really feel like every year a Muslim should dedicate a month just reviewing the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi, it will give you hope, it will give you focus, it will give you direction. One man trying to change an entire peninsula, an entire nation that led to the change of the world. The amount of aggression, oppression, discrimination, women oppression, slave oppression, weak oppression, the right and left oppression, for him to start with what? 
with service, with compassion, and try to find, are you compassionate? Yes, come and join me. Are you compassionate? Yes, come and join me. Are you compassionate? Yes, please help us out. And he will get people started embracing Islam. And people made fun of them. And people tortured them. And people killed them. I mean, we are facing nothing comparing to that generation. That's why we say, radiyallahu anhum wa ardahum. It's unbelievable what they went through. I mean, imagine, imagine the mentality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The entire situation around him is pitch black, bleak, nothing, doom and gloom. And he has this vision in his head. This is going to be bright. And everything goes against that vision in his head. And people tell him, what are you talking about? You coming to change Arabia? You don't know the Arabs? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I know. You, don't know. you don't know how dark is the picture? No, no, no. But I see the vision. And he refused to look at the ugly reality. He kept on looking at the vision, focusing, 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 until he stood up in his final speech in Khutbat Hajjat al-Wada' and gave the historical human rights declaration for all Muslims and for all humanity and he told them listen to me for maybe I will not see you after this year let me spell it out to you let me and when you read Khutbat Hajjat al-Wada' it's nothing but human right after human right after human right destroying the traditions of Jahiliyyah that is built on oppression and building the traditions of Islam that is built on justice brothers and sisters if you don't learn the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Every year, once a year, you know, when I was a child, people talk about the Milad. Do you know what was the Milad for us? For an entire month, we will have, you go to the masjid and you hear the seerah of the Prophet You go to the masjid and you hear the seerah. And at the end of the month comes the Milad and then you celebrate. By then, you are an expert on the seerah. Year in, year out. The Milad was a revision of the seerah of the Prophet in Libya. I'm talking Benghazi. You know Benghazi? Where Hillary Clinton is from? That's where I was born and raised. You know, Maliki's to the core. Warsh <laughs> Riwaya to the core. And Qalun too. And you know, it's, it's unbelievable. And you go there, we children were not allowed in the masjid to walk in and play. I mean, it's the day of judgment if you walk in and play in the masjid when you were a kid. Not like today, we're like, please come to the masjid, we'll give you candy. The only candy, the only time we were allowed to walk in and play and eat cake and drink juice in the masjid was at the time of the milad of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam yani they made us fall in love with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam just through the event of the milad may allah reward them it's an entire generation that passed away and now what we're getting the literalists the people who want to kill him even if they find a qabr of a muslim who's dead they'll blow up the qabr ajib wallah but you blow up the dead what's the you blow up the living also the dead yani this is interesting you know one time I saw a caricature, you know, it's saying, you know, someone is trying to teach, you know, the children, you know, uh, suicide bombing. So he's telling them, listen and listen very well. I'm going to only do this once. <laughs> you know, what, 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 which Islam are you learning? I mean, come on, people. What, what did we get out of that? People love their deen? No, we didn't. That entire generation, Libya, under Qaddafi, because these places were allowed to exist, graduated some of the largest number of Huffad, memorizers of the Book of Allah. When the relationship got better between the United States and Libya, and they allowed the Libyan students to come here, they became the free Qaris in almost every masjid, leading Salat al-Taraweeh with beautiful voices. And you would ask him, where did you come from? Libya. Qaddafi? Yeah, Qaddafi. You memorize the Quran? Yeah, I do memorize the Quran. Entire generation of memorizers of the Quran, because there was some religious freedom for these events to happen. Now what? So brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, history is coming and history is changing. Alhamdulillah, we are spoiled, you know. We're sitting in Marriott, you know, chicken breast <laughs> dinner. You know, you can get vegetarian if you don't want. On a very nice table, very nice screens. But we're still changing history. Life and money did not spoil us. Money is the means that we get closer to God, not far away from God. And this is why we are here tonight, to make silently history, day by day, with our sweat and blood. Islam, one of the most amazing things in Islam. Wallahi, it's beautiful. From the days, 1400 years ago, the first principle, money, time is money, is an Islamic principle, prophetic principle, Khulafa al-Rashidin principle. Time is money, time is money. 
When Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan paid the Imam, the first one who paid the Mu'azzin and then the Imam, some people told him, you pay them for leading Salah? He said, no, I don't pay them for leading Salah. God will pay them that. I pay them for holding them hostage in the masjid and not allowing them to do any other job because time is money. That's why I'm paying them as an Imam and Mu'azzin. I'm paying them for the time, not for the job. Time is money. To be paid for mental anguish, mental anguish, and emotional distress sounds very 21st century. You know, someone came to the Prophet ﷺ and he was a Jewish man, verifying the description of Rasulullah in the Torah. He came, he gave loan to the Prophet. And the Prophet ﷺ did not have a problem dealing with money with the Jews. Most of the loans that the Prophet ﷺ did, including the day he died, he borrowed from the Jews and he gave them back the money. So the man came to him and pulled him and said, you family of Abdul Muttalib. He didn't only insult the Prophet, he insulted his entire tribe. Yani for an Arab, that's the end of the world. That's the day of judgment, that's the day I die, right? He, you family of Abdul Muttalib, you take money and you never pay it back on time. Umar al Khattab took the sword out and said, let me just chop off his head right now, Ya Rasulullah. The man saw the sword, you know, illuminating under the sun, he started shaking and shivering. Rasulullah said, put back your sword. You could have done something better. You could have asked me to pay him on time and you could have asked him to ask me nicely, better than your sword. Ya Umar, since this is what you have done, now I'm gonna borrow the money from you. You go and pay the Jewish man the money. And by the way, get closer. And he got closer and Rasulullah Sallallahu say, pay him 10 dinar, like we're talking about 10 pieces of gold extra. He said, why Ya Rasulullah? He said, that's a payment for how you got him scared, for him being scared of you. Pain paid for mental anguish and emotional distress. Sayyidina Umar looked at the Prophet. The Prophet said, Ya Umar, go and pay him. So he went and gave him and gave him and gave him and he finally said, this is 10. He said, Allah Akbar, you're giving me more? He said, it's not because of me, it's because of him. Just, you know, you know, you know in check. He said, the Prophet said, because I scared you. He said, he said that? He said, yes. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That's the description of this Prophet in our Torah. That's what I was looking for. Brothers and sisters, we need, as the brothers say, to go back to that. We have it in us. We can do it. Wallahi, we can do it. But it takes step by step and without institutions and without education and without all of that, it's not going to happen. You are making history and you don't know it. Huge centers that are graduating generation after generation. That's why, brothers and sisters, you know, MashaAllah, Allah has blessed your community. And I know we have few. I would like to start before I do the fundraising with seeing if anyone would like to bless this effort, this humble endeavor and effort for the sake of Allah to change our reality and the reality around us. Someone who can help us with $50,000 inshallah today. Someone who would like to make history. Someone who gives money with love, not gives money with pressure. Gives money because he loves Allah, she loves Allah. Because money, they earn money, but they spend it. They have no problem spending it because of that love and connection. You know how much money is beloved to the human? I'll tell you how much money is beloved to the human. The human is willing to die for his money. And it doesn't make sense. You know why? Because if you die, you're not going to enjoy that money. How in the world do you die defending your money? When you die, you're not going to even enjoy it. But money is more beloved to the human than his own life and soul. That's why Allah said in the Quran, struggle in the name of Allah with your money and with yourselves. And Allah mentioned money before the self. Because it's more dear to you. Imagine what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that to struggle and to give because Allah gave you a guarantee. I'm telling you, Allah gave you a guarantee. What's the guarantee? You are going to donate tonight. And every night you donated before. Allah is not going to allow it that you donate and he doesn't give it back to you. It's not going to happen. He will not allow it. Why? Because Allah will not allow anyone in any moment of history to be more generous than him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exalted is he. So in the same nanosecond, you said, I'm going to give 50,000. Allah said, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Before you do that, I'm going to give you back 100,000. And Allah never gives back the same. And I'm talking reward in dunya, not akhira. I'm talking about reward in dunya. And I say this, not because I want to emotionally pump you, because I have heard stories upon stories, people that attended fundraisings, 
came back after a month or two, six months, next fundraising, and they told me stories that are mind-boggling. Like, unbelievable things happen when people make a covenant with Allah and say, here is your Allah, I give fee sabila. So before I start the fundraising and asking people to donate, I just want to see someone who would like to give fee sabila, because every community has heavy, heavy donors. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at his days. Abu Bakr was a heavy donor. Uthman ibn Affan was a heavy donor. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was a heavy donor. Who else? The first donor in Islam. The woman that first believer, first woman that made, first person on the planet that made wudu and salah was Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu ta'ala. I don't know if you know that. Right after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we will be discussing this, inshallah, in our seerah, starting tomorrow for two weeks at SBIA. May Allah reward them. They open the doors, and MCC open the doors. Inshallah, for two weeks, you can come in person. You can attend live streaming. You can attend the recording whenever you want. You don't even have to attend it on live streaming. But every year, we have to have a seerah for at least a month discussing the life of the Prophet to remind ourselves and to connect ourselves to the roots. The first woman... Rasulullah goes with Angel Jibreel, Gabriel, to the mountain. He hits the mountain with his heels. The water gushes out. Jibreel takes a form of a human, makes wudu. Rasulullah makes wudu. Jibreel alayhi salam stands up. Rasulullah stands up next to him. Jibreel prays two rak'ah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam prays next to him two rak'ah. And Jibreel looked at him and he said, that is your prayers and the prayers of the prophets that came before you. Now go and teach your ummah. Rasulullah goes home and the first one that did wudu and salah was Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu ta'ala. Imagine, imagine this woman, imagine this pillar, dedicated herself, financed Rasulullah from day one. You don't do the job, I'll make the money, you go and make da'wah. This is how Islam happened. If Rasulullah didn't have Khadija, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Bani, Abu Talib himself and Ali, Sayyidina Ali, they put their everything they have fi sabilillah, subhanallah, how would have Islam started? I know some people say, why do I have to donate 50,000? Don't say why. Say, Alhamdulillah, I am the one who can donate 50,000. Not why. Thank you, Allah, for enable me, enabling me to give $50,000. So do I have anyone before we start? Someone with love. As Allah said, they give what they give with love. Not to be thanked, not to be recognized, but for the love of Allah. And they have a relationship with Allah. Every time they give, Allah gives them back. Every time they give, Allah gives them back. Every time they give, Allah gives them back. And that's why the brother said, courageousness is a muscle. Develop the muscle. You might have never stood up in your life and said something courageous. Try it out. You're not going to die. Nothing is going to happen to you. But you develop the muscle. Also, giving is a muscle. If you've never given in your life, you think, oh my God, if I give, I will be bankrupt, my bank account will go to zero, and I'm fried, I'm done. No, 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 no. You will not be fried, inshallah. You will be in Naim, Nadrat in Naim. Allah will give you the Nadra of Naim. Your face will, will face will illuminate, your health will progress. Do I have one? I just want to get that out of the way because subhanAllah, every fundraising in MCC, we had someone to donate $50,000. Either he forgive it from the Qard Hassan, or he give it as a check, or he give it as a, I don't know, 401k or whatever, you know, URA or all of these things. Some way, some way, some way, somehow, they're giving, mashaAllah, la quwata illa billah. And Brother Asif just told me that the MCC now president is our sister, mashaAllah, here. So we're following the footsteps of Khadija, radiallahu anha, and she's, he, she comes with what? With a British accent, so don't mess around with her. She's going to get to you, you know. You don't mess around with the sister. MashaAllah, la quwata illa billah. May Allah reward you. Do I have any donor? Do I have anyone that would like to bless us and ignite the night? And everyone that donates after you today, you will get a copy of their hasanat. If we raise 300,000 tonight, Allah will count it that you didn't donate 50,000, that you donated 300,000. So please help us out, brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable you and give you MashaAllah la quwata illa billah it's not too much brothers and sisters it's too little how many 50,000 have you made since you've came to the United States of America or since you started your job 
Some people, they make $50,000 a year. Some people, they make $50,000 a month. And that's the fadl of Allah. ذَلِكَ الْفَضْلُ ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمُ Who are you, our first donor or, you know, the igniter of tonight? Anyone would like to take that? Anyone? If you don't want to raise your hand and you want to text any of the brothers, Brother Zuhair Siddiqui, Brother Asif, you know, and or Brother Pervez Qurayshi, if you want to tell them, we can do that because I don't want to spend so much time. I just have witnessed with my own eyes almost every fundraising there is someone who give $50,000. So I just want to give the chance to the people. Do I have anyone? Anyone in the name of Allah? Bismillah. Tawakkalna ala Allah wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Subhanallah. That's okay. That's okay because I haven't started my fundraising so I'm not disheartened. I'm just like, you know, having fun with you, inshallah, and giving a chance of ulil fadl and ulil albab and ulil absar to come forward. And as sabiqoon, as sabiqoon. Allah talks about these people in Al-Quran. There are people who always come first, alhamdulillah, and they have gotten us used to be first, mashallah. Where are you? First donor 50, mashallah, la quota illa billah. Anyone, mashallah, anyone would like to make history and help us out? Alhamdulillah. Tayyip, if we cannot have one person with $50,000, which I know it will come at the end of the night, it always does. Do I have two people that will help each other to together become $50,000? 25 and 25. Anyone? Any two people? MashaAllah, la quwata illa billah. Any two people? Alhamdulillah. Any two people? One, two. 25, 25. That's okay. InshaAllah. Allah will give us whatever is in our rizq tonight. No one is stressed out here. We are just trying to fulfill our pledge with the people who gave loans to the masjid. To honor them because then our institutions will never receive loans if we default on our loans so who would give Allah a good loan imagine Allah goes down to our level human level and Allah says listen if you don't want to donate forget it just give me a loan I'll pay it off <laughs> it's very interesting how Allah speaks to a level where the human beings understand if you don't want to donate don't donate give me a loan i will give it back to you many folds and it will not be riba it will be baraka fadl from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do i have two people with twenty-five thousand? One and two do i have two people with twenty-five thousand? mashallah any two people mashallah maybe the people in the back they can update us and tell us something uh, maybe inshallah because envelopes are coming and I am just here as Allah said فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر remind you're only a reminder you have no control over them I have no control Allah has control over you just let Allah do the miracle subhanallah brothers and sisters when it rains the rain goes and finds where open channels are it goes find open channel if it finds open channel the rain will make the channel wider and bigger because more rain is going down, more rain. If the channel for whatever reason closes and gets clogged, the water will back off and will find somewhere else to go from. Exactly the story of rizq. Allah sends people rizq. The one who gives more, his channel becomes bigger, Allah gives him more. It rains more on his side. The second he closes the channel, the rizq will back up, back up, back up, and Allah will send the rizq to someone else. And that's the lesson we learn, brothers and sisters. So do I have two people with $25,000, some two channels of rahma, of ata, of sakha from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Let Allah use you as a channel of his mercy and of his support, inshaAllah. As, you know, the ulama used to make dua, Ya Allah, make us keys that opens the gates of goodness and locks that locks the gates of evil. Huh? Ya Allah, make us keys that opens the gates of goodness and locks that locks the gates of evil. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Who wants to be a key today? Do we have anything? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, la quta illa That's okay. Because we haven't started the fundraising yet. MashaAllah. Okay, brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah, I know, MashaAllah, from my experience from before, 
the donation keeps coming and we never fail. We've never walked out of a fundraising that was a, a failure at MCC, alhamdulillah. We've always walked winners. So I am full confident, you know, I have full confidence that inshallah tonight we will succeed and do well as we always do, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Brothers and sisters, if we have 10 people in the room, if we have 10 people in the room, you know, each one will donate $10,000. We will end up with $100,000. You see, I asked for 50, I'm confident I'm gonna get the 50. I asked for 225s, I'm confident that I'm gonna get 225s, inshallah. So that's 100,000. I want to move to the second 100,000. I need 10 people, each with $10,000. Who will help us out, brothers and sisters? If you don't know, if you don't believe, go to the MCC and look with your own eyes. Look with your own eyes, brothers and sisters. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> so, if you see the hundreds upon hundreds of youth and children and activities and women activities and serving and making da'wah, interfaith activities, talking to the neighbors, visiting other churches, other churches coming and visiting, it's a whole rainbow of good deeds, amal salih, of activities. And everyone, Allah uses him to where he's good at. And that's very beautiful. So I want, inshallah, 10 people, each one with $10,000. Do I have anyone, alhamdulillah, with $10,000? Do I have anyone, mashallah, la quta illa billah, with $10,000? So that we can roll for the next 100,000, alhamdulillah. And we will be able to reach our goal, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. Brothers and sisters, remember where you stand. Remember where you are. You are in the Bay Area. The whole world looks up to the Bay Area. This is where history gets made. Do you know where the idea of community colleges came from? It actually came from Berkeley. The idea of having two years community college, which is all over the nation, started from here. Brothers and sisters, we have Google here, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, and all the other, Oracle, Cisco, for God's sake, I mean, it's unbelievable. Every company that does large scale change in the world is here, close to you. We underestimate our effect on the rest of the world. You know, when I go Malaysia, you know, Singapore, Indonesia, and I tell them, you know, I tell them, do you know where's our location? Where, where next to them? Oh, my God. The entire dialogue changes. The entire interaction changes, subhanAllah. The rest of the world is looking up to us here. Wallahi al-Azim, brothers and sisters. Yani, in Muslim countries, in Muslim countries, they wish to have the type of Islamic centers we have here. You know, Muslim countries, you go to Malaysia, you go to Singapore, you go to Indonesia. They say, we wish we have the way you attract your youth in the Islamic centers in America. In Turkey, brothers and sisters, it's a majority Muslim country. But the youth there, when they hear, how do we deal with the masajid here and how we have activities for everyone and camping and watching movies and go bowling and go paintballing and go this. They go crazy. You do that in the masjid? Yeah. Do you know if we do this in the masjid, they'll shoot us, they'll kill us. <laughs> you know, if you go to Pakistan, many of you here are from Hyderabad. And I visited Hyderabad like three, four times. Spoke in front of like 100,000 people. Unbelievable. And they all like, what can we do with our youth? What can we do? We're losing them. They're not coming to the masjid. What I said, you need to do what we're doing. Tell me what we're doing. I said, you, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just, I want you tomorrow to advertise on TV. They have a channel that there will be an event only and only for high schoolers. No middle school is allowed. No college student is allowed. Subhanallah, like a thousand youth showed up. Because you started targeting. They felt, oh, you're talking only to high school. Next day, we said, we're going to only have an event for for college, for college students, oh my God, Osmania University. My God, it was full from as far as your eyes can see. Because people don't know how to do these activities. I'm telling you, we're making history, we're changing the world. If in the Muslim world they start doing what we do here in America, 
the entire understanding of religion will change. I mean, you know, people have come with this uh, interpretation of the hadith, a positive interpretation of the hadith. The hadith says, the day of judgment will not come until the sun rises from the west. The sun every day rises from the east. Until the sun rises from the west, the day of judgment will not come. So some interpret it in a positive way. They say the sun is the truth. And Islam rose the first time from the east. The second time Islam will rise from the west. We're looking for a beautiful sign, not a horrible sign. Until the sun rises from the west, it means until Islam flourishes from the west again. Because, you know, sometimes you go to the east, they're so stuck in tradition, they can't see the truth anymore. Truth or tradition, I'll take the truth. Truth or culture, I'll take the truth. Truth or whatever I think is right, I'll take the truth. And the truth is, Islam is very attractive to all ages. This is the solution, brothers and sisters. You know, you feel sometimes you want to scream loud. You, you see now, the weapon, the new weapon of ISIS is using children. Yani, subhanallah. How else the solution is, except in Iraq and in Syria, children are attracted to the masjid like they're attracted at MCA and MCC and SBIA and Saratoga. That is the solution to the ISIS problem. What we do here is a solution. You don't see it in the big picture. You think, oh, this small masjid, what are we doing? This is the solution. This is the solution. Our children here are on the front run, front run of technology. I mean, mashallah, in Saratoga, I, we have kids in the masjid that made, you know, that made a, a, a robot and went to Amazon and said, would you take my, my robot to deliver? You know how they said now they're going to deliver packages through, with Amazon through robots. They made a, a robot like a, a, a quadcopter that has the four fans. Unbelievable Muslim children. One of the Muslim children, Eritrean. MashaAllah, may Allah bless his parents and bless him. His heart is in the masjid. He came to me and said, Sheikh, would you like to come to one of my classes? I come to your classes. Why don't you come to my class? I said, I'll come. How old are you? He said, I am 13 turning 14. I said, and what class do you teach? He said, I teach how to, how do 3D printers work and how to do 3D printing. I said, okay, where, in your middle school? He said, no, I teach the class at Stanford University. I said, you teach who? He said, graduates and undergraduates. I said, and, and, and how in the world? He said, when I was nine years old, I got attracted to it. And now I am like a, a world resource to 3D printing. I have 14 3D printers at home. I said, can you print me a car? He started laughing. He said, Sheikh, pretty soon I will be able to do that. But right now I can print you a hammer. We can even, there are printers that print actually with bacteria. It prints cells, like actual cells, a living you know, a living thing. It prints with the 3D printers. He started talking to me. I just gave him a hug. Alhamdulillah that we have amongst our youth people who are like that. There is a young person in Fresno, a young Muslim, you know, high schooler, had the perfect score, not a single answer wrong on SAT and ACT. Full score. One kid in both exams, he walked in 100%, he walked in 100%. They interviewed him on every channel. This is the solution to the world's problem. This is the solution to the youth, to the Muslim youth worldwide. We provide the example. Don't think small, think big. That's why, brothers and sisters, yani, alhamdulillah, don't belittle what we're doing in these Islamic centers. You might think, oh, it's a small thing. No, it's a big thing. These institutions are big and huge. MashaAllah, la quwata illa billah, tabarakallah. So, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Do I have anyone with $10,000? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. That's okay. That's okay. A lot of the donors did not come tonight to the dinner. But inshaAllah, they will donate. And the caravan will continue to travel. And the journey will continue to be traveled. And no center will stop because of, uh, you know, lack of funds. There is no lack of funds in our Muslim community. Alhamdulillah, there's plenty of funds. I'm just trying to think what's next, brothers and sisters. Do you know how many 
young men and women in the Bay Area that have started a company and sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars? You want to know? On March 22nd, I'm inviting every one of them that I can get my hand on. I'm inviting every one of them to come and give a speech. 15 minutes, their life story. People who sold their companies, 400 million, 500 million, 750 million. And so far, I've got so many confirmations and they are excited to meet the Muslim community because we always tell them to come to the masjid. They come and pray, they leave. But they were never able to, given the chance to do something, they don't know what to do. So I said, come and tell us your story. That's what I want you to do. May 22nd, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. We're going to have a seminar of success and leadership from middle school, high school, college students, men, women, sisters who want to start non-for-profit organizations, Brothers who want to do some business, start an app, start a company, you will get a consultation from people that if you go in the real world, they wouldn't meet you in six months and they wouldn't give you five minutes. But they are our Muslim brothers and sisters in our community and they're more than happy to do that. Inshallah, Rabbil Alam. So, you see, you just have to ask and Allah gives. We got $25,000. Takbir. You think it's dry, it's not dry. Alhamdulillah, it's raining. The drought is over. We have El Nino right now. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Make sure you don't get wet on the way out, inshallah. Or if you want to follow the sunnah of the Prophet, when the rain used to fall in the beginning of the season, he used to stand up in the middle of the rain and get soaked. And he used to say, this rain was just born. It's pure and sinless. It was just born. It has just came to existence and it's freshly glorifying its Lord. So he would walk in the masjid and the masjid at the time of the Prophet didn't have a rug or carpet. It was mud. And after salah, people used to laugh. Salaam alaikum wa salam alaikum. And then used to laugh because their faces were full of mud and their hands were full of mud and their knees were full of mud. And sometimes they would splash the water on each other inside al-masjid al-Nabawi sharif And the Prophet ﷺ would look at the sahaba and smile and they would laugh. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, such a humble place with no carpet graduated some of the greatest men and women in history. Subhanallah. That's the lesson. That's the lesson that we get. It's not about the walls. It's about the people. And you have some nice people. Very welcoming people. MashaAllah, I've never approached MCC to be, do a seminar, to do anything. They said, Sheikh, come, the center is your center. Open wide. Whatever you want. MashaAllah. May Allah reward them. Same thing, SBIA, mashallah. They said, come, the center is yours, mashallah. MCA, come, it's open doors, mashallah. We don't have ill feelings, we don't have hatred, we help each other. Every fundraising, all the masajid help each other, mashallah. That's beautiful. Yasin Foundation, come, youth, Yasin, youth, you know, center in, in Burlingame. You know, next time when you're landing, look to the left. You're landing in San Francisco airport, look to the left, you're going to see Yasin Youth Center. You can get there, stop there on the way back from the airport or on the way to the airport. You can stop by and pray to Raqqa. Subhanallah. We are spreading silently. People are beating, 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 but we are minding our own business and doing what we're supposed to do. And we're hurting no one. We are benefiting everyone. We're not hurting anyone. We're benefiting, alhamdulillah, the Muslim and the non-Muslim. One event after another, mashallah. Just in the last two, three months in Yasin Foundation, they've invited the, the churches and the officials and, and you do that here. No one will stop us, inshallah. So, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Do we have 10 people with 10,000, mashallah? Anyone with $10,000? Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar wa lillahi alhamd. Allahu Akbar wa lillahi alhamd. Mashallah. Tayyip, they're, they're doing the calculation, inshallah. I really appreciate one thing, that you sat down and you had sabr. Fundraising succeed not because people give money, it's because they sit down and have sabr because Allah says, Inna Allah sabirin. You might not donate yourself, but the fact that you sit down and listen encourages someone else to donate. So don't think that by you sitting down and listening is a waste of time. A'udhu billah. This is how we support at least the least. They say, be where Allah would like you to be. 
and do not ever show yourself to Allah where he doesn't want you to be. Hmm? Be where Allah wants you to be. And you are here. There is no better place to be in other than this place or another fundraising that is supporting a house of Allah and a community center. You are exactly where Allah wants to find you. That's beautiful. You will find Allah exactly when you need him. You will find him because he found you exactly when he wanted you. And where he wanted you, he found you there. You will find him there when you need him. Subhanallah. Allah doesn't need us, but we need him. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So, do I have the next level of donation? Alhamdulillah, $5,000. They are calculating and they are continuing, inshallah, while we are encouraging each other and doing what we're doing here is you know let me tell you about a fundraising Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did Rasulullah sent a letter a letter to the king of Rome Caesar he said this is from Muhammad the son of Abdullah to Caesar the king of Rome if you become Muslim Allah will give you peace and Allah will reward you for you and your nation. If you deny Islam, you will be judged on the day of judgment on your behalf and on behalf of your nation. Wassalamu alaikum. Bas, I am inviting you to Islam. In answer to that one letter, Rome sent three armies. The first army is the army of Mu'tah. The second army is the army of Tabuk. And the third army is the army when the Prophet ﷺ was dying. He sent them a letter. Just welcome. I invite you to Islam. If you accept, you accept. If you are not accept, you're going to be responsible on, in front of Allah. They said, oh, who are you to talk to us like that? Who are you? Rasulullah ﷺ, in the second wave, they sent 250,000 soldiers, Roman soldiers, to wipe out Muslims in, Mac in Medina. Rasulullah said, if we wait for them to come to Medina, we're all dead. We have to come and meet them northern. Rasulullah stood up. There is no food, no camels, nothing. Stood up and made fundraising. The Sahaba had a difficult two years with no rain in Medina. Rasulullah stood up. Who will give? Who will give? Who will give? No one has anything to give. Everybody said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm bringing myself. I'm bringing my camel. The money that I have is enough to feed my family and help me with the journey to go with you. I'm going nowhere. I'm going with you. But I don't have money to give. So they couldn't raise their hand. Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan saw the Prophet asking, 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 and nobody's answering. Nobody. Rasulullah is doing fundraising. Nobody. People don't have. Uthman ibn Affan anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, whatever the total number of your fundraising, I will give one third of it. One third of the total fundraising, it's on me. Rasulullah said, Jazakallah khair ya Uthman, barakallahu fi. Rasulullah started doing fundraising, 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 asking, encouraging, nobody's raising that. They say until the eyes of Rasulullah became red. Because no microphones, so he's speaking, making everyone... Sayyidina Uthman stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, I ask you by Allah, take it easy on yourself. The total fundraising, the second third is on me. Please just sit down. Rasulullah said, okay, we are one third away. Fundraising, fundraising, fundraising. Nobody stood up. Sayyidina Uthman said, until the voice of Rasulullah was gone. Hatta buha sawtuhu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, the final one third is on me. For Allah's sake, sit down. Khalas. It's enough. Do you know what Rasulullah said something? Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan reminded people of what Rasulullah said when they came to kill him. He said, one day Rasulullah looked me in the eye and said, Uthman shall not worry whatever he does for the rest of his life. Allah has forgiven him. Ma ala Uthman ma sana'a ba'da thalik. Uthman shall never worry about whatever he does for the rest of his life. I'm a witness that Allah has forgiven him. Because of one fundraising dinner, one fundraising event, people who came to kill Sayyidina Uthman because they were not happy with his style of khilafa, what did they end up with? This is the literalist. You're not good enough. 
You're not a good Muslim enough. You're not strict enough. You're not following the Quran. You're not following the Sunnah. Abu Bakr died as a victim to that. I mean, Uthman ibn Khattab, Uthman died as a victim to that. And even Ali, the cousin of the Prophet, the husband of Fatima, the father of Al-Hazm al Hussein, was not still good enough in the eyes of these people. Literalist, literalist, literalist. Ya Ali, you are a kafir. Na'udhu billah. Why? You didn't put Quran as judgment. You asked to the judgment of human beings, not Allah. Who are you to talk to Ali ibn Abi Talib like that? Karram Allah Who are you? You see, this literalism and this uh, fanaticism, uh, extremism, from the days of the Khulafa, it did, not, it did us no good. But you know what's the good news? Always Islam prevails and survives and comes back to its moderation. Those people that are trying to think, if we kill more people and we make Islam stricter, we make it, it's going to become better and we're going to have the Khilafa. They're going to get nothing but defeat. And they will not put a dent in the history of the Muslim Ummah. People will curse them. Allah will curse them and his angels will curse them. That's what Allah said in the Quran, not me. Ulaika alihim la'natullah wal malaika wal nasi ajma'in. Brothers and sisters, these people will not. What we're doing here is the counterfeit to what they do there. And alhamdulillah that Allah is using us as a tool of goodness to make a history for the ummah, insha'Allah, Rabbil Alameen. So I am not bothered that nobody is raising his hand. Because if nobody raised his hand with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who am I? I'm nobody. As a matter of fact, alhamdulillah, every time people raise their hands, mashallah, we've raised what? I would, I would say anywhere between six to seven million for this Islamic center, two million for the, uh, for the old land, and then four million here. MashaAllah, la quwwata illa billah. We're very lucky because Rasulullah left us with goodness, and he said, al khayru fiya wa fi ummati ila yawm al qiyamah. Goodness is in me and in my ummah. The goodness of Rasulullah is inside each and every one of you. Wallahi, if you think you're not religious, the goodness of Rasulullah is inside you, whether you know it or not whether you believe it or not. The goodness of Rasulullah is inside each and every one of you. You just have to act upon it. And Allah will show you wonders and miracles. So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, you see, MashaAllah, we're sitting down, drinking water, sipping coffee, and eating cheesecake, chicken breast, MashaAllah. And we raised what? $125,000, one third. Yani, if we just have an, two Uthman, in the crowd, <laughs> they'll take care of the other third and the other third. <laughs> 100. And by the way, in this masjid, we raised $100,000 per person in one fundraising. Yes, we did it. It's no, it's no alien to this community to raise 100000 per person. It happened and it will happen again, inshallah. Rabbil Alameen. I am absolutely not worried. Alhamdulillah. I think a lot with the weather and with the change of time, people got really knocked out tonight and they didn't come but I'm very confident that inshallah by the end of the two three months you would have raised and Ramadan is coming mashallah whatever we don't do tonight we will do it in Ramadan very easily Allah opens the hearts and soften the hearts on the night of Ramadan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen so anyone did not donate would like to donate inshallah five thousand two thousand one thousand you know alhamdulillah you know, if everyone here who didn't donate, donates 1,000, khalas, we hit the 200,000 easily, no problem. It's the small donation that makes the big difference, you know, because it's uh, distributed on the larger crowd, you know, instead of heavy, one person carry it, you know. So the brothers are going around with your uh, credit card swipe or ATM machine or alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, elastic money. You can always, inshallah, donate, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, mashallah, keep it up. Keep MCC being active. Keep it being welcoming to the people who come in. Men, women, young, old. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Keep it spiritual and moist. Don't make it dry, right? Alhamdulillah, you have all the elements of success for an Islamic center to succeed. Alhamdulillah. All the elements of success, alhamdulillah, the, 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 the hardworking people, 
the good intentions, the sincerity, the devotion, the dedication, it's going to happen, inshallah. لا قوة إلا بالله الحمد لله رب العالمين. I think uh, brother Pervez and brother Zahir, صديقي, how are we doing? الحمد لله. خلاص. Any more? Any more uh, uh, donations coming? inshallah رب العالمين. ها. الحمد لله. خلاص. ما شاء الله لا قوة إلا بالله. So الحمد لله رب العالمين. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى reward you and bless you for being patient, for sitting down. This is really, um, alhamdulillah, make dua for MCC, for our community, for our country, inshallah. Ya Allah, we ask you. This actually explains 150 to pay off Qard Hassan and 150 for remodeling funds, inshallah. That's what, if you wonder where the money is going, inshallah. Allahumma rabbana ya rabbal alameen. Barik lana fi mujtama'ina hadha khasa wa fi sa'iri mujtama'at al-muslimin. اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا واجمع شملنا وحد صفنا وأخرج الغل والحسد والحقد والكراهية والضغينة من بيننا يا رب العالمين اللهم أبعد عنا الفتن ما ظهر منها وما بطن اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من الغلا والوبا والزنا ومن ومن غلبة الدين وقهر الرجال اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من الهم والحزن ومن العجز والكسل ومن الجبن والبخل ومن غلبة الدين وقهر الرجال برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر لحينا وميتنا وحاضرنا وغائبنا يا رب العالمين اللهم واشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين اللهم واشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين اللهم اجعلها طهورا لهم ومغفرة لهم ورفعا لدرجاتهم يا رب العالمين اللهم واحفظنا واحفظ أبناء وبنات المسلمين من كل شر وسوء وحرام يا رب العالمين اللهم احفظنا بالإسلام قائمين وقاعدين وراقدين وفي كل وقت وحين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين يا الله we ask you to bless our center يا رب العالمين and to bless all the other Islamic centers يا رب العالمين يا الله we ask you for your blessing and for your بركة to dwell between us يا رب العالمين يا الله we ask you to show us the right path and to show us what we should do and what we should execute and what activities to do and what decisions to make. Be our guide, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, inspire us, energize us. Ya Allah, give us the vision and the understanding so that we will make this ummah a better ummah day by day, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, it is you whom we seek and we only run from you to you, Ya Allah. You are the only God. You are our God, la ilaha illa ant, subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimeen, bi rahmatika arhaman rahimeen. Ya Allah, bless the brothers, the sisters, the young, the old, everyone who helps and participate. Ya Allah, we ask you for our Muslim brothers and sisters who don't come to the masjid, that you inspire them to start coming to our centers and participate and witness the beauty and the love and the mercy between us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, make us lights that you guide others with make us channels that you give mercy and forgiveness to others through ya allah make us uh, minarets and make us lighthouses that will show the others and guide humanity to the truth and to you ya rabbal alamin subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifuna wa salamun ala mursalin walhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in rabbil alamin jazakumullah Assalamu alaikum everyone. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's a blessing to have Sheikh Al Bakri in Beria. I think it's over a decade, year after year, he comes to different fundraisers all over the US and does amazing fundraisings. People don't feel they are giving the money, but Alhamdulillah, we reached the goal. So far, we have many successful fundraisers for our MCC fund. Uh, MCC project. So I would request all the community and especially Khari Amar to make dua for him and his family. Jazakallah khair Khari Amar. Uh, Sheikh Al Bakri. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamualaikum wa sallama wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Our Ustad and Sheikh Ala Al Bakri who already made beautiful dua. So I'm not here to make a dua, Brother Asif asked me to make a dua for Ala al-Din al-Bakriya. 
So I'm just going to make a dua for all Al Al Bakri. We have Salah al Din al Bakri in here, Ala al Din al Bakri. By the way, al Bakri comes from the family of Abu Bakr al Siddiq, or the ones who doesn't know. So Al Al Bakri, the prophets are Sabran Ala Yasir, fa inna mawidakum al Jannah. Uh, the first people who died in Islam, the, the family of Al Yasir. So we say Al Al Bakri, mashallah. They're beautiful uh, people. I know all of them. Salah Din, mashallah, he came all the way from San Francisco area. They're always helping community. They're always with North Star, MCC. So please make dua for Ala Al Din Al Bakri. He's mashallah, shining person. Allah gives him noor. Allah gives him, gives him, mashallah, tawfiq, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase him in tawfiq and nur and knowledge, inshallah. Allahumma zidhu ilman ala ilman, ya rabbil alameen. Allahumma zidhu nuran ala nurin, ya rabbil alameen. Allahumma abad anhu, ya rabbil alameen. Kulla sayyatin, ya rabbil alameen. Wa kulla mikrin, ya rabbil alameen. Allahumma zidhu min fadlih. Allahumma sturhu wa hafidhu, ya rabbil alameen. Allahumma hafidhu wa awladahu wa aailatahu wa zawjahu, ya rabbil alameen. Allahumma ikhfidh ikhwanahu. واحفظنا جميعا معهم يا رب العالمين اللهم زدنا ولا تنقصنا وعافنا واعف عنا وآثرنا ولا تأثر علينا اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سخطك والنار اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وترضاه وخذ بنا واصينا إلى البر والتقوى اللهم وفق إمسيسي ونورث ستار والزيتونة وأبيروس وكل مؤسساتنا ومساجدنا وزدنا يا رب العالمين اللهم زدنا من فضلك اللهم زدنا من فضلك يا رب العالمين وبارك في علمائنا إمام طاهر شيخ حمزة إمام زيد وكلهم جميعا إن شاء الله في هذه المنطقة وفي باقي المناطق إن شاء الله ما الله سبحانه وتعالى increases in knowledge and iman and in yaqeen إن شاء الله ما الله سبحانه وتعالى bring us together here in khair and here after إن شاء الله in jannah in highest place in jannah jannat al firdaus with our prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم أردنا حوضه واسقنا من يارده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نضمع بعدها أبدا اللهم اجعلنا من يحبون الله ويحبون رسوله ويتبعون سنتهم يا رب العالمين بفضلك وجودك وكرمك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم احفظ لنا أولادنا واحفظ لنا بناتنا واحفظ لنا نساءنا يا رب العالمين آخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا Before we end, we'd like to recognize our event sponsors one more time. From our platinum sponsors, we'd like to thank Rahma Market. From our gold sponsors, we'd like to thank Kabul Kebab and Grill, the Law Office of Spojmi Naziri, the North Star School, the Rajabali Family Dentistry, the Rumi Bookstore, and the Law Offices of Ross Pitlick. We thank you again. And we'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight in support of your local Muslim community center. We pray that you are rewarded immensely for your great generosity, and we look forward to seeing you at future events to see the fruits of all your continued support, du'as, and donations. To conclude, we'd like to, invo to, we'd like to invite you all to join us for Isha Salah in the adjoining room. Jazakallahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>